ano sa palagay mo ang kailangang tulong ng ating mga industriya para mapantayan nito ang narating ng mga industriya ng ibang bansa? Paano mo ikukumpara ang mga produkto na gawa sa atin sa produkto galing sa labas? Paano makatutulong ang syensya at teknolohiya sa lokal na industriya sa pagpapaunlad ng produksyon? Sapat ba ang naibibigay na suporta ng gobyerno sa maliliit na mga negosyo? Ano ang mga pulisiyang dapat na isulong ng mga susunod na leader upang mapaunlad ang lokal na industriya? Ang pagpapatibay sa lokal na industriya, mahalaga nga ba sa pagbangon ng bansa mula sa pandemya? Industrial Policy and Nation Building Bahagi ng Hashtag Pilipilunas 2022 Webinar Series ngayong March 22, alas 9 ng umaga. Good morning and thank you everyone for coming. This is the Pilipilunas 2022 webinar on industrial policy and nation building. We are now streamed live on the UP Diliman Pilipilunas 2022 UPCIDS DZUP and UP Diliman Facebook pages. This webinar is organized by the UP Diliman Task Force on Nation Building, an initiative of the UP Diliman Office of the Chancellor, and also co-convened by the UP College of Engineering uh, and the UP Center for Integrative and Development Studies Political Economy Program. It is also co-presented by DZUP 1602 and the UP Diliman Information Office. At this point, We would like to begin our webinar with uh, a few wel uh, welcome remarks from the UP Diliman Chancellor, Dr. Fidel Nemenzo, who is the 11th Chancellor of the University of the Philippines Diliman and also Professor of Mathematics at the College of Science, whose specializations are on number theory, elliptic curves, and coding theory. Chancellor Nemenzo. Salamat, Jal. Maganda umaga sa lahat. Good morning. Again, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar on industrial policy and nation building. Ito po ang huling installment ng Pilipilunas 22. No? Pagbangon at pagsulong tungo sa magandang buhay at pupas. No? This is a series of roundtable discussions on governance and development issues organized by the Task Force Nation Building under the Office of the Chancellor. Just allow me to introduce this webinar series. No? Pilipilunas um, is... Um, our university's response to two imperatives of the times. The first imperative is, of, uh, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic, no? and this, which has exposed uh, the vulnerabilities of the Philippine state and pattern of development. The, the crisis uh, brought about by the pandemic reminds us of the need to strengthen state capacity, especially in the delivery of health and other social services on one hand, and to deepen and broaden the domestic foundations of growth. Now, the second imperative is the coming national and local elections this May. Uh, elections are always deeply consequential, and these elections come in the midst of an existential crisis that has heightened debates on policy issues and political platforms. And the reason why we respond to these imperatives is because public service and nation building have always been at the core of our university's mission. We want to impress on our policymakers and the public our university's readiness to help our country build our political, economic, and sociocultural institutions on more sustainable and equitable foundations. Last year, we formed the Task Force on a Blueprint for Building the Nation uh, that leads the Pilipiluna series, uh, which brings together our faculty res and researchers, policymakers, and other stakeholders to reflect on the state of our nation and recommend policy and um, multidisciplinary approaches to problem solving. From this series of roundtable discussions, we hope to draw up a governance agenda that we hope to contribute to the national conversation leading up to the elections. So the series was launched last uh, August 2021 with a webinar that set the tone and frame uh, for uh, Pilipiluna series by asking the basic question, ano nga ba ang magandang buhay at bukas para sa mga Pilipino? 
Uh, this was followed by seven webinars on the public transportation sector, on electoral and political reforms, on local governance, on strategic um, uh, formal relations, on higher education, on economic recovery and transformation, and just uh, two weeks ago on the national social protection floor. Today's webinar begins with the recognition of the important role of industrial policy in building and deepening the foundations of economic growth and development. This is in line with our country's commitment to SDG 9 of fostering innovation and promoting inclusive and sustainable industrialization. For our panel, we've invited representatives of our science and engineering community, researchers on MSMEs and manufacturing, government agencies at the forefront of the industrial policy initiative, industry leaders and other stakeholders to discuss how to move and push the industrial industrialization agenda forward. Uh, in this webinar, we asked the following questions. What role do science, technology, and innovation play uh, in development? How do we align our S&T outputs with the needs of industry? How do we grow our M MSMEs and ensure their integration in value chains in the market? What is the status of Philippine manufacturing? What are the prospects for its growth? What are the challenges to manufacturing and industrial growth? And how do we raise the level of academia's participation in our country's efforts at industrial development. From the, from the discussions in the webinar, we hope to draw up a policy, uh, policy recommendations as inputs to an industrial policy governance agenda. I'd like to thank the conveners of today's webinar, uh, Dr. Tonet Rakiza of the UPCIDS Political Economy Program, Dr. Happy Denoga, Associate Dean of the College of Engineering, and of course, our moderator, uh, Dr. Jalta Gibao of our political science department. And again, I thank our partners in this project, DZUP 1602 and the UP Diliman Information Office. Finally, I'd like to thank our panelists and discussants, Dean Gani Tapang, Dr. Tonet Rakiza, um, uh, Dr. Happy Dinoga, Professor Alan Diaz, Attorney Adrian Cristobal Jr., Dr. Danilo Lachica, Yusek uh, Fita Aldaba, Mr. Menileo Carlos III, Engineer Rafael uh, Nestor Mantaring, and of course, uh, Secretary Boy de la Pena. And of course, I'd like to thank the UP Diliman Task Force Nation Building and its chair, Dr. Tonet Rakiza, for organizing the Pilipilunas 2022 webinar series. And to all of you, thank you for joining us in this webinar. Maraming salamat at magandang umaga sa lahat. Thank you very much, uh, Chancellor Fidel. Uh, now to start off uh, the discussion, uh, our first speaker is Dr. Giovanni Tapang, uh, who is Dean of the UP College of Science and a professor at the National Institute of Physics. His research interests are in sensors <laughs> and signal processing and networks and information. He earned his BS, MS, and PhD in physics from UP Diliman and was a research visitor at the Computational and Nonlinear Quantum Optics Group, uh, University of Strathclyde, Glasgow, Scotland from uh, 2003 to 2004. Dean Tapang uh, also served as president of the Samahang Pisika ng Pilipinas and is a recipient of various awards, among them the 2016 UK Newton Fund Leaders in Innovation Fellow, UP 2011 Centennial Professorial Chair, One UP Award, a 2004 Gawad Chancellor, Pinakamahusay na Nilathalang Pananaliksik, Science and Technology Cluster, and the UP International Publications Award in 2002 and 2002. Dean Tapang? Good morning. Um, and, um... Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, thank you for the organizers for this chance to share about the role of Philippine science and technology um, in the community and science and technology in itself in industrial development. This is the outline of what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, we just have to review a bit on what science and technology and what do we really mean by development 
then connect it with the topic of our discussion today. Let me start with, um, but by looking at by looking at how we train our scientists and um, engineers, um, it has uh, been in the news for the past few years before the pandemic that uh, in the third international math and uh, science survey, uh, we actually rank um, consistently low, even in the previous uh, team survey, where we ranked 41 out of 45 in math, uh, sorry, and 42 out of 45 in science was the last one. And in the grade four math and science, we actually ranked last. Um, this is been um, upheld also by the PISA study, where 15 year old in the Philippines uh, scored lower in reading, mathematics, science, than most of the countries that participated in that. No country lo scored lower than the Philippines and Dominican Republic. If you think about it, then that really explains the lack of um, scientists, science students who are en entering the uh, university uh, because we don't really have that uh, large number of well-trained high schools um, and we can actually blame not only of course the, the, um, the topics but mainly because of the lack of um, expenditure or uh, funding for uh, education which is the Philippines was lowest among those countries and uh, if you compare it with the OECD average, we really have a lack of uh, funding with regard to education. Well, even if we actually get to train them, um, the, the number of graduates that actually go out of the country to look for quote unquote greener pastures um, have been increasing since 1998. Uh, the, la the latest data that we I can find from the DOST, um, uh, around 25,000, 26,000 have been going out every year uh, with regard to um, uh, looking for employment as OFW. Half of these are health professionals, but uh, one fifth would be engineers and the rest would be other ICT um, and other professions that have science degrees. Well, it, it, it doesn't really um, surprise us anymore that because of this outflow of experts, uh, we actually get to see that the Philippines ranked uh, very low with regard to the availability of scientists and engineers in the global competitive report, competitiveness report of the World Economic Forum. Of course, another factor that uh, affects the quality of science education is how our um, are the policy of the state to really actually export labor uh, instead of just training uh, the experts here and maintaining them here in the country. We end up really with uh, graduates of BS biology working as bank tellers, BS chemistry working as PE, uh, physicists from college selling toothpaste uh, and uh, very under and underemployed uh, professionals who have trained themselves as uh, scientists, uh, but really having no jobs as scientists here in the country. These are the realities of the under and mismatched employment that are faced by our science and engineering graduates in the Philippines. Students go through several years of hard study in high level science. Um, but end up doing activities that do not really require quantum physics, do not really require those skills that we give here in the university. One may think that the problem is in the curriculum. We might not be that responsive with the needs of the industry, but we really need to look at what, mean, what training do we really give our scientists and engineers to be able to appreciate the changing problems that will come up not only in industry, but in science and technology in general. Well, the question of course of science and technology and development, I'll just look, uh, I, I use this slide for my science and technology and society class. Science and technology really arise with regard to the production activities um, to meet uh, humanity's material needs. So 
we try to study uh, nature to to figure out how it works and the 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 understanding and knowledge that we generate is being used to create new processes, new products, and new technologies that we use in our daily uh, production activities. Now, of course, this has a dual uh, relationship with each other. Uh, when we get to improve society, we get to improve as well. Science and scientific activities depend on the changing needs of society over history. So therefore, this is the question really of how do we improve the science and technology is just really a question of increasing the number of scientists. Uh, then we can just provide more um, scholarships. Is it about building the necessary infrastructure? Uh, do we really just create new, better um, universities? Do we tailor fit the curriculum to the needs of industry? Or as the UPS will be do, is doing and is, uh, will be doing in the next few years to create a research university for the national, as the national university infrastructure here in the country. Um, or should uh, you know, the university just really look at how to generate successful technologies that will translate to the needs of industry? The NAST told us um, a few years ago that um, in order to meet the UNESCO's threshold for the number of scientists and engineers, we really need to produce 3,000 new PhDs each year for the next 10 years. The problem, of course, would be that um, even the University of the Philippines um, would have um, difficulty really in um, reaching this because uh, UP Diliman produces around 64 PhDs per year on the average. Um, out of these are around 13 come from the CS and around four to five come from the College of Engineering. So if they're going to talk about the expertise or the experts that the University of at least UP Diliman is producing, we really are very far to the requirements of um, of uh, the NAST's targets. Well, we can look at why there is a lack of demand um, for the experts that we have. And I think um, our U USEC uh, later can expand on this more. Um, manufacturing has been relatively flat since the 1960s as part of our economy. And it's not really just flat, it's actually decreasing. Um, a lot of our economic activities has been taken up, taken up by services and um, our production activities, specifically, specifically manufacturing, uh, which would, would be the ones that would need the new innovations, the new technologies um, in the country is actually been shrinking for the past uh, few decades. Technologies used in the industry are really focused on assembly and testing. We rarely do product innovation. Uh, mostly we, because mostly we import the technologies that we use in um, our industries. And the minimal R&D expenditures of the private firms in the country reflect the fact that of course, we're really mainly dominated by foreign capital. And we do not really get to use the whole full capabilities of the science and technology personnel that we produce here in the university. And therefore, if you really want to be a scientist, kung gusto mo magpakasyantista, mahirap hanapin yun dito sa bansa kung hindi ka magstay sa universidad kasi walang ganun kalaking uh, research and development activity um, in local firms. Um, the problem, of course, is chronic because uh, Ever since, as, as you have seen in this decline, uh, we really lack the basic industries that produce the jobs for our population. And um, the basic industries that we have are fragmented. Uh, this is a paper by uh, our guest later, um, uh, Professor Aldaba, Yusek Aldaba, that uh, now um, she has been saying uh, ever since that uh, manufacturing has been weak. And there are missing, there are gaps between our extractive industries and our 
um, output here in the country. The linkages between the small medium uh, uh, enterprises and the large enterprises remain limited. And there's a concentration of Philippine exports to just electronics, garments, and textiles and other parts. And um, most of these are low value added and mo uh, mostly just labor, um, uh, putting them together from the imports that we have and re-exporting it out of the country. And therefore, we really need to look at the, the importance or the, um, the need for an industrial policy in the, in the country. Um, later, we will be listening to how local industries in micro and livelihood enterprises, which make up around nine tenths of our the businesses in the country, um, would probably be needing technologies uh, that scientists and engineers could very well develop here in the country. But there has to be a clear industrial policy that will help build those domestic industries at all levels from the small to the large. Uh, we really need to look at how we can harness the industrial and agricultural output that will come out of this increased um, productivity. And for a scientist, for an engineer, there are real, this will open up the, the opportunities for basic science research, for applied research, and looking for engineering solutions to the problems that um, these domestic industries will be uh, bringing out. Uh, we do have science parks, uh, but far from being the industrial hubs where our national industries will be born, these science parks and techno hubs are examples of how we get to um, employ local uh, engineers, local scientists, but they are employed by foreign uh, multinationals. Uh, inside these parks, usually uh, these are expert processing zones. Uh, most of these involve the electronics industry, as pointed out in uh, the earlier paper that I mentioned. The idea of building incubator parks, just like um, Silicon Valley near Stanford or Route 128 in the MIT area, um, is far from what we see in the science and technology parks that we have here in the country. Uh, in contrast, because there is no local or domestic industries in the country, the intellectual output of our universities really do not directly go to um, those who would be needing them and vice versa. We do not get to see the problems of domestic um, um, businesses because there is a lack of uh, interaction between the two. And moving forward really, uh, we really have to look at how to improve the lines of collaboration between the academic scientific community, the inventors, and bridge them with those businesses that we'll be needing. We really have to look at how to build a national industrial policy, not just because we wanted to have a um, industries here in the country, but to have industries that will maximize our capacity to produ produce our own capital goods to provide the intermediate and consumer goods for domestic needs to generate that domestic uh, market that we really have as 100 million Filipinos can generate. Of course, we could also mobilize the available domestic capital in order to build this uh, national industries that we have. The idea, of course, is to produce primarily for domestic consumption, and probably that's why we should be looking at a nationalist industrial policy in the end. Agricultural production, of course, of which main, many of our people are still engaged in, has to be developed with local scientific support as part of a agrarian reform uh, program. And um, this really has to be looked at because we don't really have all the software and uh, hardware uh, needs. Uh, there are a lot of um, agricultural uh, agrarian reform, uh, agrarian link uh, activities that has, that can benefit from the technologies that we develop, not only in the university, but within our own industries. 
the the last point that I'd like to put out probably here is that we we have to ask, of course, when we try to have a to build a national industrial policy, um, the development of local science and technology will follow suit because you will be developing the the demand for um, an increased number of scientists, increase of a number of problems that we solve, and there therefore having better uh, research activities. But the development of um, local, the local industrial uh, economy uh, really has to look at where do you want to bring this industrial economy to? Um, to, to what end are we developing our industries? Um, because we can actually ask the uh, foreign investors to build the industries for us. But at the end, even though we, we will have those industries, can we actually sustain them without uh, continually depending on these foreign investments? We need genuine investments in science and technology. They should be coupled together by not just the investments in developing HR, uh, human resources in science and technology, but also building those industries that will be using, uh, that will be needing these experts here. National industrialization really pl plays a part in developing science and technology, and science and technology will be key towards building those industries that we will be needing in the future. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the fourth industrial revolution, um, IoT, um, artificial intelligence, etc. These are being done here in the universities, but where do we bring those technologies unless you have ready um, industries that will be using them uh, for the Filipino people? And I guess that's the whole uh, answer with this question that I put here in the slide. We really have to do that industrial policy for the benefit of the majority of the Filipino people. Thank you very much. And that will be all for my input for today. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Gani Papang, uh, Dean of the College of Science of, the, of UP Diliman. Uh, our second speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Gerald Joe C. Danoga. Uh, he is professor of, uh, in the Mechanical Engineering Department uh, of UP Diliman. He has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, a master's a degree in mechatronics engineering, and a doctorate in energy engineering. He established the Design and Manufacturing Center at the department and currently the head of the Machine Design Laboratory. His efforts to be an innovator include the design of a more fuel-efficient hybrid electric drivetrain for public utility vehicles. His collaborations with industry include the design and development of commercially successful biomedical products. Dr. Dinoga, as we mentioned earlier, is currently the Associate Dean for Research of the UP Diliman College of Engineering. Dr. Dinoga, you now have the platform. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I hope you can see my slides already. Um, in this, uh, for my talk today, I'm going to be actually presenting some things that in relation to what Dean Gani Papa mentioned about bridging the gap between industry and the academe. Now, when the, word, when the word university is mentioned, most people think that it is simply a place of higher learning. While we do aim to provide the best education for our students, most people are actually unaware that research actually comprises 40% of our key performance indicators and another 10% for service and extension. This means that aside from teaching our students, half of our efforts go to sharing our knowledge directly to the community, the government, and the industry. How we share this knowledge is a three-pronged approach. First, as researchers, scientists, and engineers, or RSCEs, as we call them in the scientific community, we disseminate our knowledge through scientific publications and conferences so that anyone anywhere in the world can actually do a Google search for our scientific output. Our second approach is through our advocacies. We talk to communities, to administrators and legislators, 
and share our views on issues like nuclear energy, biofuels, renewable energy, the environment, traffic and transportation studies, and responsible and sustainable mining. In line with this webinar, however, I would like to focus on our last approach. This is the university being an innovator and incubator of technology. Speaking from my background from the College of Engineering, we strive to develop new knowledge. Moreover, we strive to apply that knowledge to develop new technology. And then further strive to bring that technology out into the world into the form of products and services. And this is where industry comes in. The university is not an island. We get ideas from the evolving world, from our students who bring their work experiences, and from industry. We have had industry people approach us with an idea scribbled on a napkin, asking us, can we explore this? Or it could be something that they wished they had that would help their business. Or a game-changing product, if there was just somebody who could bring that idea to life. Or simply an engineering solution to a production problem that no one can seem to solve. For innovation, however, we, it requires three ingredients, expertise, effort and resources, and an en enabling environment, all of which our university actually has. Of course, we can still further improve upon it. But let me show you some numbers to prove my point. Compared to the UNESCO benchmark of 380 researchers, scientists, and engineers per million for developing countries, the Philippines in 2006 had only 130 RSEs every million population. Of that, half are in higher education institutes, like this one. Given the number of companies that we have versus universities, it is highly unlikely that a company has people devoted to improving their current products and developing new innovations. In contrast, our college aims to have an all PhD hiring policy. In terms of resources, the UNESCO benchmark for the national R&D spending is, should be 1% of the gross domestic product. In 2006, the Philippines spent only 0.11% of our GDP on R&D. Last year, we did better with 3%, or a total of 20.8 billion pesos on R&D. To put that into perspective, the UP Diliman College of Engineering has about 1 billion pesos of research funding each year. The university has many laboratories and expensive equipment dedicated for research. Few companies can afford maybe a 5 million peso microscope or a 7 million peso software license to develop new technology. Instead, their bottom line often tells them to focus on manufacturing equipment and production costs just to keep them in the black. These facts and figures are glaring signs that point to the only logical step to achieve industrial growth the partnership of industry and academia. Now in the past, our collaborations in industry have included the following forms, technical services, industry assistance, collaborative research, and product design and development. Our laboratories have provided technical services and industry assistance in, for, for examples in the in the laboratories mentioned below. For example, uh, under the Civil Engineering Institute, we have the Construction Materials and, Structure, and Structures Laboratory with their Building Research Services, where they have collab provided uh, technical services such as material testing and building analysis. In the Mechanical Engineering Vehicle Research and Testing Laboratory, we test for vehicle performance and emissions and our data has actually been responsible for the Biodiesel Act of 2006. We also have a manufacturing center where we have industry grade CNCs that are typically normally too expensive for starting companies to procure, but, but instead companies have approached us to do their prototyping and sometimes their small quantity fabrication. We also have a machine design laboratory where 
we've collaborated, for example, with the DOST for the 3D scanning of GPs and tricycles, and even for a ship hull for a bow retrofit. So these are technical services and industry assistance. We have also had uh, training. We did train to boost the internal research and development capacity of industry. Examples here are when we provided training to the Western Digital Storage Philippines on the topic of electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. We also provided an extensive training on heating and ventilation, air conditioning and refrigeration, Emerson Climate Technologies for their train the trainer program. And for the SD microelectronics, we also did training for the characterization of chemical properties. So these are direct provision of either knowledge or data, okay, which will enable these companies to, uh, to decide for themselves what, how they can boost their capacities and improve their products. But beyond that, we have also been able to do formalized collaborative research and product design and development with industry. One such example is the Artisan Power Laboratory, Power Electronics Laboratory in the Triple E Institute. The students there uh, do their research, which are actually to solve industry problems in Artisan. So they are actually provided funding, regular funding by the, by the company so that they have an active partnership. We also have uh, examples like the, the um, AAA materials R&D consulting facility where they have done uh, failure analysis for the Kalaka Power Generation Company. And we have uh, the Machine Design Laboratory in the Mechanical Engineering where we developed the powered air purifying respirator for the company of Silicon Technologies. Now, in the absence of industry, we have other initiatives to start up an industry. This, of course, requires R&D and technology development. We have several partners, including LGUs, the Philippine Senate, and government agencies. Our strongest partner, of course, is the Department of Science and Technology. Listed here are their current initiatives. In the interest of time, I will just flash some of our projects that can be viewed later through our internet stream. So we have here, for example, the products of under the DUSD Science for Change program under the Cradle umbrella. Okay, we have several projects here. We also have projects under their NICER initiative or their Niche uh, Center for Research. Okay, so we have four here. Take note that these are collaborative uh, projects with other universities as well as industry. And we also have our biggest, of course, of the grants and aid, several listed here. Now, we also have uh, energy research just uh, two, years, uh, two years ago, where the Philippine Senate actually funded the Energy Research Fund, as shown here. And uh, I would like to go back and highlight one of the DUSD NICER projects that showcases how the university helps start up an industry. The e-mobility program by Dr. Kriya is being implemented in region four with the Cagayan State University and the UP Diliman. The center will support the electric vehicle industry to produce cost-effective and energy-efficient vehicles. Before any such vehicle can be produced, this center is poised to design and develop electric tricycles that can be locally manufactured in the Philippines. I would also like to highlight UP Sibol. It is a UP system collaboration to develop local biomedical technologies. In 2020, the coronavirus caught the country off guard, highlighting medical supply chain problems. The aim of the UP CIBOL program is to reduce our dependency on imported equipment. Listen here are some of the projects between the UPD College of Engineering and the UP Manila College of Medicine. Once innovative technology is developed, the country can only benefit from it once it is in the market. Existing companies might commercialize the technology developed by the university through appropriate tech transfer protocols. In the university, the TTBDO handles intellectual property disclosure, patent filing, and product licensing. The university also has a technology incubator to the upscale innovation hub. There's several, there's several methods of incubation depending on the level of industry involvement. The college also taps its huge resource of alumni through the UP Engineering Research and Development Foundation Incorporated. 
Their network, headed by captains of industry, is a matchmaker between our researchers and industry. Ladies and gentlemen, I have shown you our successful examples of the university as an innovator and technology incubator. We strive to develop technology and provide that to industry and even build industries where there are none. As such, it is only in our mutual interest of national growth, national growth that develop policies that will bring academia and industry closer and promote technology-driven, evidence-based decisions. Thank you very much and have a good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Denoga. At this point, let me just announce a few things for our participants, a few reminders. Uh, if you have questions, please post your questions on the Q&A Google form that was uh, sent or that's being circulated now through Zoom chat. And those questions will be read during the open forum. We also encourage that you use uh, the hashtag, no? hashtag Pilipilunas2022 in posts regarding this event. Thanks. So uh, we hope that you'd be able to uh, enrich the discussion later on uh, during the Q&A by uh, at least with your questions. At this point, uh, we are now inviting as third speaker, uh, Professor Rolando Ramon Diaz, uh, he is currently the head of the Training and Entrepreneurship Education Division of the UP Institute for Small Scale Industries. He was former OIC Director of the Institute from February 2017 to January 2018. He teaches at the National Graduate School of Engineering of the UP Diliman College of Engineering, where he was awarded professorial chairs by Nippon Telecoms, uh, and the Cesar Buenaventura Foundation. Professor Diaz was also conferred the Gawad Chancellor Award as Natatanging Research Extension Professional for 2019 for his contributions in championing the advancement of MSMEs in the country. Professor Diaz, you now have the platform. Salamat, uh, Dr. Tagibao. Okay. Uh, magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Uh, gusto ko lang pong i-present sa inyo isang uh, research paper na ginawa namin ukol sa maliit na negosyo. Okay. So, uh, i-slide show presentation ko lang po para mas malaki. Okay. The title is Enhancing the Competitiveness of Philippine MSME Textile and Garment Industry. So, uh, ba bago sa lahat, ma makita natin ang contribution ng maliliit na negosyo sa ating bansa. Ito po ay sa nagko-contribute na 99.52% uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises. So ibig pong sabihin nito, uh, less than half, half of 1% is contributed by the large companies in the Philippines. And more so, they contribute 53.1% of the total labor force. But ironically, they only contribute about 35.7% of the grow, uh, total uh, value added. So medyo nakakataka na 99.52% ng negosyo eh less than one third ang kinokontribute sa ating ekonomiya in terms of total uh, value added. So doon, nung tinignan ko ang comparison ng Pilipinas sa ibang uh, karate nasyon sa ASEAN, nagtaka ko dahil ang Pilipinas ay nagiging huli compared mo sa Thailand or Malaysia wherein ang contribution ng MSME is about 60 to 70%, tayo ay kalahati lamang. So parang sinabi ko, ano ba nangyayari? Kailangan sigurong tignan natin na isang sektor ng MSME na makikita natin napakalaki ng potensyal pero hindi talaga na itatap yun to the fullest. At ito po yung tungkol sa MSME. Makikita po natin ang Philippine MSME 
is composed of two basic sector. Ang unang sector ay yung tinatawag nila textile sector. At uh, mayroon pong 961 establishment uh, based on the census of establishment data ng PSA. And most, most of the companies, although there are large companies, most are medium-sized company producing threads and fabrics. And the workers, especially on the indigenous side, are composed of spinners and weavers. Ito po yung mga indigenous people natin, informal sectors, mostly women. Uh, ngayon pong buwan na to, ay pinagdiriwang ang, ang buwan ng kababaihan. Okay? Yung pangalawang sector po ay ang garments and apparel sector na merong mostly 10,300 may get na establishment. 61% po nito ay subcontractors and backyard producers. At meron pang natitirang mga 39% na exporter. Pakita nyo po ang multiplier effect nitong sector nito. Ang mga Uh, workers po rito ay mga kabataan, elderly, informal sectors, again, mostly women. So, tignan po natin ang mga aktibidad ng mga sektor ng textile and garment. So, makita nyo po na ang unang aktibidad ng textile sector has got something to do with spinning or when they produce the thread or the yarn from fibers such as natural raw materials, cotton, wool, polyester, nylon, silk, rayon. Uh, and makita natin yung mga iba pang maganda nating fibers na, na pinya, abaka, rami. And then pagkatapos po ng spinning ay weaving which produce the threads And then these are the ones that uh, we use to produce the textile by interlacing this in two directions. And then finishing is basically uh, the uh, activity related to bleaching, dyeing, coloring of fabrics by applying various treat, uh, uh, surface treatment. Ang garment sector po natin uh, ay kinocompose ng pre-production, ito po yung design, pattern making, sample making, and modification. This is followed by the actual production wherein the cutting, make and trim, sewing, button holding, labeling, and packaging, and the post-production. Dito na po pumapasok yung branding, marketing, shipping, distribution, and retail sales. Tignan po natin ang kalagayan ng ating sektor ng textile and garments. Okay. Meron po akong dalawang period na gusto kong ikumpara. Noong 1980s and 1990s, ang world ranking po ng garments natin were the six in the world. Okay. Uh, and right now, 2021, we're even lower than the 30th. No? Insignificant po yung 30th kasi ang contribution nila ay less than 1%. Yung garment at, uh, textile and garment export natin used to be a 3 billion industry. Okay? Ngayon, uh, halos hindi lang nangahalahati, naging less than one third at about 0.88 billion. Darang po ng Pilipina, ang lang po sa Pilipinas ng, ng garment and textile was sinabi po ni Dean Tapang na we, we, we are one of the uh, garments was really one of the vibrant sector, second to semiconductor. Ngayon po, eh, ikasyam na lang, contributing only 1.4% of the total uh, dollar receipts ng ating bansa. Ang, tax, ang status po natin as textile Uh, is an importer. Importer po tayo. I-explain ko po later on yan. Ngayon po, hindi lang tayo uh, importer. We're a significant importer. Meaning, lahat halos ng mga uh, ginagamit natin textile ay importer. Status po natin as garment exporter, we used to be a net exporter 
now we are net importer. Okay. Dito po ako medyo nalulungkot dahil ang next to food, uh, clothing and shelter, kailangan itong mga basic na mga, mga, mga goods na to ay na isusuport at nabibili natin dito sa nagawa ng ating, mga, ng ating bansa. Dito po isa pang nakakalungkot na bahagi, ang employment po noong 1980s and 1990s based on the previous study was 850,000. Based on the 2020-21 na ni-request ko po for a special extraction from PSA, it was only about less than 1-8. Okay, mga 1-8. 128,165. So ano po nangyari? Okay. Bakit nagkaganito ang isang vibrant na sektor, industriya? Makita, makita po natin, pag natin, marami pong, uh, marami pong nangyari katulad ng uh, ang lack of preparedness ng mga, mga players natin to face a trade liberalization policy. Isa pong malaking pangyayari ay eh, yung termination ng multi-fiber agreement natin sa mga end of 2005. Dati po, we can export much of our produced environments to the United States. But because of this termination of multi-fiber agreement, malaki po epekto nito. Na, nawala rin po ang in-enjoy nila tax and tariff ni importation of raw materials. And isa pong uh, dagok ay yung stoppage ng tax perks na naabolish noong July 2014 yung tax credit certification due to rampant abuses of its usage. Naimbestigahan pa po ito ng COA at ng Kongreso kasi na-abuse na nga talaga ito. Pero mas kina, tignan natin, mas kinawala itong mga events ito, meron na talagang a uh, kahinaan there's there are structural weakness and deficiencies particularly i pinpointed the value chain aspect of uh, the industry which exposed its vulnerabilities and stunted its ability to develop competitively okay makikita niyo po ito po ay modelo na isang holistic and integrated uh, uh, textile and garments. Simula po ito sa raw material networks, kung saan yung mga raw materials like synthetic, natural fibers are produced, and then the component, dito po papasok yung spinning and weaving, okay? uh, yung mga materialis na galing sa petrochemicals, uh, polyester, ay, ay dito po papasok. Yung production network po, na ibang bansa ay very uh, very comprehensive if you see in North America they have uh, top their Mexican and Caribbean basin sa, sa Asia po ay maraming bansa ang ang number within the top 10 of uh, the garment and textile business. Tignan lang po natin sa garments. Sa garments mo, China, Vietnam, Bangladesh, India, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Indonesia. Doon po sa mga nimination ko sa garments, sa po doon ang ASEAN. Ano po ang nangyari sa Pilipinas at nawala siya? Then the export network is when... Uh, you cover the retail outlets and carries the brand name apparel. Okay. And then you export this. And then the marketing network is when you sell this, uh, the output of this sector to specialty stores, mass merchandise chains, and discount chains. No? Napakahalaga po ito. Makikita niyo po ngayon, pag pumunta ka sa mga, mga malls, Bihirang-bihira ka na makikita ng mga gawang garments sa gawang Pilipinas. Dati meron pa. Ngayon, mostly makikita mo galing imported. 
So, ang ginawa ko po ay tinignan ko yung mga weaknesses, deficiencies and gaps. At gusto ko po ibahagi ito sa inyo. Ang isa pong nakita kong kahinaan sa ating setup ay yung kawalan ng high-level multi-sector body that would plot and orchestrate the development policies and program for the industry. Dati po merong garment and textile board. Pero hindi ko alam kung nasaan na siya ngayon. So, of course, since wala siya, kailangan natin i-create ulit siya para gumawa at i-update yung industry roadmap. Meron po tayong industry roadmap. Nabasa ko po yung industry roadmap na yun. Kaya lang, that should be uh, a tool to converge all development programs for textile and garment industry. Isa pong nakita rin natin uh, medyo... Uh, weakness and deficiency is yung mga textile firms natin are not able to modernize their equipment and employ technologies to attain competitiveness. Makita nyo po, uh, yung mga textile natin ay maraming nagsarado. Okay? At hindi sila... Uh, nag-upgrade na kanilang facility. Ganun rin po sa garment industry. So, pinopropose po namin na gamitin yung mga proven and tested schemes na nag, uh, naging successful sa de development ng MSME like yung small, yung DOST, Small Enterprise Technology Upgrade Program or setup, okay, and yung DTI shared service facility for cooperatives so that they are able to adopt state-of-the-art state product research and development upgrading. Isa po kong medyo nahihiwaghaan ako ay wala talagang linkage between the textile uh, industry which is, should be the upstream and the downstream garments. No? Makita nyo po yung former, meaning to say yung textile, has been left on in input stage. And the latter, which is the garment, has been heavily reliant, heavily reliant on imported and consigned textiles. So kailangan natin para umunlad pareho itong dalawang sektor na to ay ma at mapalago sila eh kailangan suportahan nila ang panganga pangangailangan ng bawat isa this would promote mutual and inclusive growth for both sectors so another thing is the inability of small garment enterprise to be included in the value chain global value chain this has crippled them in adapting better design and innovative process no ito po yung kawalan na uh, I think macrocosm for MSME dahil kailangan po natin i-promote yung holistic niche involvement. Hindi lang sa aspeto, maliliit na aspeto noong uh, garments and textile, but the whole global value chain ecosystem, particularly promoting such thing as group purchasing, production and logistics optimization, okay? And likewise, uh, order consolidation, shipping and delivery, as well as marketing. Kailangan din po natin tignan yung pre, uh, production technology process so that we can adapt the international and domestic best practices. Meron naman po tayong silver lining dito. No? Okay, number one, kailangan natin Turuan by providing technical training and adoption ng best practices yung mga industry players natin. Particularly in international trade, export pricing, and familiarization with INCO terms. Yung mga INCO terms po yung mga international trade like letter of credit, trade uh, uh, on board. Hindi po nila kabisado yung mga yan. Uh, and then support isa meron na tayong Philippine Textile Research and Textile Research Institute under DOST. Ito po ay pinapanukala namin na ma-increase ang kanilang budget so that they can provide assistance 
so that they can continue their research on discovering potential plant sources for indigenous fibers. No? And adapt proven practices of LDU, katulad po na nangyari sa Taytay Rizal. No? Makikita niyo po Taytay Rizal, eh, isang silver lining na sinasabi ko dahil yung LGU mismo ang nag-promote paano, paano yung mga, mga household doon eh, makakagawa ng very competitive and very uh, passionable product that can compete with anywhere in the world. Sa pulang nating tignan, i-enhance natin yung kasi kailangan natin ng pera rito para mapaunlad ulit o ma-revive to industry kailangan natin ng participation to enable uh, these sectors to access finance and credit and then isa pong dapat nating tuunan ng pansin eh makontrol yung influx ng cheap smuggled textile including yung ukay-ukay okay makita niyo po yung ukay-ukay dati Nagsimula yan ng maliit, pero everywhere you go, you go to Baguio, puro ukay-ukay. No? So ito po ang kumikitil sa paglago ng ating garment industry. Saka yung pong smuggling, no? rampant po yung smuggling ng textile. Mayroon pong mga ibang policy recommendation para makumpleto lang po yung buong chain, eh, kailangan ang mas... Uh, mga successful global companies are evolving by studying the consumer preferences to determine the parameters that drive consumer demand. And meron pong panukalang batas na i-amend yung retail trade liberalization law na nakahain sa Senate under Senate Bill 1814. Ang tingin po ng ISSI dito ay ito ay hindi napapanahon especially at the time when most of the MSME are reeling from the effects of uh, the pandemic. Umaahon lang po sila ngayon. Marami po sa MSME sa ating bansa nagsarado. Sila po ang pinakatinamaan ng pandemya ito. We, what they need now are protection and caring support from the government and they can hardly afford any further setback arising from liberalization of the market and investment. So dito ko lang po tinatapos yung aking uh, may clean presentation at I know there will be questions uh, in, in the next few minutes. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Diaz. Uh, and as mentioned by Professor Diaz, uh, malamang marami po tayo mga tanong. Kung meron po tayo mga tanong, please post your questions on the Q&A Google form uh, that's being circulated right now in the Zoom chat. Uh, and also please use the hashtag Pilipilunas2022 in your posts. Salamat po muli, uh, Professor Diaz. Now we move on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Antoinette Ararakisa, who is Professor of Asian Studies and uh, Philippine Development Studies at the Asian Center, University of the Philippines, Diliman. She is the convener of the Political Economy Program of the UP Center for Integrative and Development Studies and chairs the UP Diliman Task Force for a blueprint on building the nation. She is also vice president of the Manila-based think tank Asia-Pacific Pathways for Progress Foundation and member of the Consortium for Southeast Asian Studies in Asia Governing Board. She received her MA and PhD in Political Science from the City University of New York Graduate Center, and she specializes in comparative political institutions and political economy of late developing countries. She was visiting researcher at the University of Montreal, uh, East Asian Center, Columbia University, Weatherhead East Asian Institute, as well as Chulalongkorn University Political Economy Center and is author of the book State Structure, Policy Formation, and uh, Econo Economic Development in Southeast Asia, The Political Economy of Thailand and the Philippines, published by Routledge. Uh, she's also, of course, uh, has, she has published several journal articles and book chapters. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Rakisa, you now have the platform. Maraming salamat. 
Maraming salamat, Jalton. Um, okay. So I'm discussing manufacturing. The past decade, so let me start. The past decade saw the Philippines break away from the legacy of low growth and into the elite circle of emerging economies, a record that would have been unthinkable a little over a decade ago. Indeed, the country's rapid growth deserves thoughtful examination since it is missing a key ingredient that has propelled other developing economies forward, a robust industrial base. Instead, the economy's strength derives from a vast workforce vetted for foreign markets. While our neighbors therefore advanced through export manufacturing, the Philippines did so through trade and services. This development pattern, sorry, this development pattern puts the Philippines right smack the debate that we are, uh, the debate on industrial policy. On industrial policy. For this webinar, we define industrial policy as government action aimed at jumpstarting the economy structural transformation that is the movement of resources from low value to high value activities. Given this broad definition, industrial policy does not only pertain to manufacturing, but also to agriculture and services. For the sectors to fall within the ambit of industrial policy, presupposes two things. One, they are involved in value adding productive activities. And two, by definition, government plays a proactive role to ensure the growth of strategic industries. Yet for free market advocates, industrial policy may bring up the specter of state failure, market, market distortions and rents, if not corruption. For sure, this debate is worth another webinar series for this morning's webinar. However, suffice it to say that where the panel or at least my presentation is in this debate may be gleaned from the webinar's objective of contributing to the governance agenda, of the UP Diliman Task Force for Nation Building. My presentation will make a two-level argument. First, I will argue that even in the Philippine context of high growth, manufacturing matters if we are to achieve sustainable and inclusive development. Second, I will argue that for domestic manufacturing to take off would require no less than a high capacity yet pragmatic developmental state that would set policy and mobilize resources in order to harness the opportunities and minimize the risks that come from intensifying globalization to advance our national economic interests and society's well being. My presentation is organized as follows. The next section will briefly review the basis for the assertion that manufacturing is the engine of growth and examines this in relation to the changing global trends. Next will be a discussion on the limits of the country's development pattern and the, implicate, and the implications of this on manufacturing before ending with some policy recommendations. With that, let me now give a summary of the thesis on manufacturing as the engine of growth. As argued, the sector is key to raising a country's productivity and incomes. Among the economic sectors, manufacturing has the highest labor productivity growth that is five times more than that of agriculture and two and a half times more than that of services. Manufacturing goods are also demand elastic. That is, production can expand because its output, especially those from the basic industries, can serve as inputs to other industries and thus not be limited by the demand of direct consumers. The sector is associated with increasing returns to scale and economies of scale, serves as a market or source of input for other industries and sectors, and thus facilitates backward and forward linkages produces externalities and promotes technology, innovation, and transfer. Noteworthy, the revival of industrial policy in developed and developing countries since 2000 came in the wake of global recessions. Stiglitz et al. point out that the shift in the primary causes of global and domestic economic crisis from colossal state failures in the 1970s and 1980s to crushing market failures in the 1997 Asian financial crisis and the so-called Great Global Recession of 2007 to 2008 has contributed to the return of industrial policies even in the advanced countries 
such as the US, starting with the Obama administration's policy in 2012 of bringing manufacturing jobs back to the US and the British government's UK reshore plan in 2014. The 2007-2008 recession has also marked a shift in the direction of trade in manufactured goods. The slump in consumer demand in advanced countries moved the gravity of global consumption to Asia. As a Brookings Institute paper noted in 2021, 55% of the global consumer class or 2.2 billion consumers lived in Asia. The Asian Development Bank further explained this shift as follows. As Northern countries engaged in a long, and I quote, engaged in a long and painful process of deleveraging, increasing savings to reduce high debt levels and rebuild lost wealth, consumer spending in Asia's developing countries will drive the necessary rebalancing of the world economy from export-led to domestic-led consumption growth. Combined, the revival of manufacturing in post-industrial countries and the rebalancing of trade in manufactured goods to developing Asia have implications for the Philippines' pursuit of industrial development. Identified as having among the world's fastest growing consumer markets, the Philippines fits the rebalancing narrative to a T. We are a country that consumes goods that we ourselves do not produce. In fact, we have a curious situation of high, pri high private consumption, yet low labor productivity. While household consumptions of goods and services accounts for more than 70% of gross domestic product, a figure only surpassed by Cambodia among ASEAN countries, the Philippines labor productivity is among the lowest in the region, as the table will show. Equally telling, high private consumption does not mean an expanded middle class. During this period of high growth, the number of middle income households grew only by 2% while the number of poor and lower income households decreased by a mere 1%, suggesting the limits of a growth pattern largely fueled by remittances. The consumption-led growth fueled mostly by billions of dollars of, of uh, OFW earnings has contributed to the country's premature deindustrialization. And this partly explains why 55% of the workforce or a staggering 21 million Filipinos make a living in the informal economy. That said, it is also true that the country's burgeoning trade in services has given domestic manufacturing a growing local market for its products and therefore a second chance at industrialization. This situation of a growing consumer market on the one hand and low labor productivity on the other hand has led to a re-examination of the country's weak manufacturing sector. The potential of manufacturing to bring about structural transformation and broad-based growth may be gleaned from the following figures. In 2015, while manufacturing establishment represented only 11% of the total number of formal enterprises in the country, it employed one in every five workers paid about 22% of total compensation, the highest among the sectors, accounted for 31% of the country's total earnings and was the biggest contributor, total value added at 25.8%. Thus, since 2012, the Philippine government, specifically the Department of Trade and Industry, has pursued a series of industrial policy programs, notably the Inclusive Innovation Industrial Strategy in 2017. The Department of Science and Technology has also launched several initiatives under its Philippine Innovation Program. Altogether, such programs seek to contribute to increasing manufacturing the manufacturing sector's share in total value and total employment to 30% and 15% respectively. These government initiatives or intervention keep the promise of Philippine manufacturing alive. Nevertheless, the gains that such efforts, may, such efforts may prove too little if the country does not make a conscious, even Herculean effort to balance the momentum of a demand-driven growth based on remittances with a growing domestic manufacturing sector for local and export markets. 
leaving economic development to the market has led to premature industrialization, as mentioned. Since 2005, the country's investment patterns follow the consumption needs of remittance receiving households. Real estate, education, health, retail, all of which favor the country's commercial elites. Partly because of this revenue stream, a 2011 study estimated that the combined wealth of the 40 richest families in the Philippines was equivalent to 76% of the country's gross domestic product. More today, in keeping with the rebalancing to Asia's thesis, foreign companies are waiting to be let in to the consumer market with the passage, as mentioned by, uh, by uh, Dr. Alan Diaz, Senate Bill number 1840, that will lower the minimum paid up capital requirement for foreign retailers from $2.5 million to $300,000. Obviously, in an attempt to draw in foreign investors, government has trained its sites from manufacturers to small and medium retail dealers of imported consumer goods and services, a decision that will only worsen the country's chronic trade deficit. What would then make Philippine manufacturing come into its own? Today, the country has an opportunity to rethink and redirect its development strategy toward building domestic capacities for industrial development and a resilient economy. Supply chain disruptions and depressed global demand stress the importance of strengthening domestic manufacturing alongside agriculture and services, as well as local economies. No doubt, much needs to be done, but in the interest of time, I will just mention a few recommendations some of which have been already mentioned by previous speakers. One, as we move on to promote a knowledge-based and innovation-driven development, there is the pressing need to promote technology as a collective good. Toward this end, government needs to raise its investment in research and development and to mobilize the science and technology community to strengthen small and medium enterprises participation in the country's modernization efforts. Three, mobilize revenues from the trade in services for industry level productive activities. Four, improve tax administration and implement progressive taxation. If we want to grow our manufacturing sector, we must take into consideration the differential impact of taxes in different sectors. For instance, manufacturing and other productive activities require long gestating investments which differ from commercial activities that thrive on quick inventory turnover. Five, if we are to help domestic manufacturers enter into the supply value chain, this will require assisting and incentivizing our small and medium enterprises that produce intermediate goods. Six, recall the Retail Trade Liberalization Act. And seven, explore different institutional arrangement in public service delivery beyond that which was recently signed by the president when he uh, went on the bill that liberalized and would like to turn over full responsibility for our tel telecommunications, uh, shipping, and, uh, and public transportation to foreign interests. With that, I will end my presentation. Maram Salamat Salamat. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tanet Rakiza. Um, so once again, uh, if you have any questions in mind, please post your questions in the Q&A uh, Google form that is being circulated uh, in, uh, in the Zoom chat. Uh, and uh, your questions will be read later on during the open forum. Okay. Uh, at this point, uh, we'd like to uh, show you a video uh, by DZUP on industrial policy and uh, nation building. Uh, this is a video entitled Pulso ng Masa. Ano sa palagay mo ang kailangang tulong ng ating mga industriya para mapantayan nito ang narating ng mga industriya ng ibang bansa? 
may mga batas pa sana na mas makakatulong sa mga maliliit nating negosyante at sa kanilang mga produkto o serbisyo. Government incentives and subsidies, lalo na sa innovation strategies ng mga lokal na produkto. Kailangan mabigyan ng sapat na trabaho ang mga manggagawa at asa ng kanilang mga sweldo. Paano mo ikukumpara ang mga produkto na gawa sa atin sa produkto galing sa labas? Mas madaling makabili at makahanap ng mga mas murang produktong galing sa ibang bansa, eh, gaya ng China, ganyan. Magandang kalidad ng mga produktong gawa sa Pilipinas, subalit ano kulang ito ng uh, endorsement and promotion, kaya madalas hindi napapansin. Mga produktong may kalidad at matibay ang gawa dito sa atin, saka mas naayon sa pangangailangan natin. Mas mahal nga lang kumpara sa gawa sa mass production ng katulad sa China. Paano makatutulong ang syensya at teknolohiya sa lokal na industriya sa pagpapaunlad ng produksyon? Tingin ko eh, kung mas high-tech eh, mas okay, di ba? Sa tulong ng syensya at teknolohiya, maaaring makadiskubre ang mga eksperto ng mga bagong imbensyon na maaaring gamitin sa pagpapabilis o pagpapabuti ng produksyon sa mga industriya. Makakatulong ang syensya at teknolohiya sa pag-improve ng varieties ng mga produkto upang maging mas competitive tayo sa merkado. Sapat ba ang naibibigay na suporta ng gobyerno sa maliliit na mga negosyo? Mukhang hindi eh. Madalas sa babalita ngayon ng mga maliliit na negosyante at manggagawa na nawala ng trabaho o lumitang kita dahil sa pandemya. Hindi ito sapat dahil mas inaasikaso at tinibigyan pansin ng national government ang mga malalaking kumpanya. Sa palagay ko hindi at parang never magiging sapat. Ano ang mga pulisiyang dapat na isulong ng mga susunod na leader upang mapaunlad ang lokal na industriya? Siguro pulisiyang magpapalakas at magpapalawig pa sa exportation ng ating mga lokal na produkto. Government subsidies at incentives para mas maengganyo pa ang mga tao na magnegosyo at mga pulisiya na makakasulong sa pagtangkilik ng lokal na produkto tulad ng mas mababang tax. Pulisiya para direct farm to market ang mga produktong agrikultural. Mas maigi na magtaguyod pa sila ng mga programa para sa mga MSMEs. Bigyan sila ng financial na suporta at gumawa ng paraan upang mas ma-promote pa ang mga lokal na produkto. Industrial Policy and Nation Building Bahagi ng Hashtag Pilipilunas 2022 Webinar Series Thank you very much. At this point, we are now going to have our main discussant, Dr. Rafaelita Aldaba. She is the Department of Trade and Industries Undersecretary for Competitiveness and Innovation and serves as a member of the Board of Governor of the Philippine Board of Investments. She fulfills a key role in the uh, formulation and implementation of the inclusive innovation industrial strategies, uh, which puts innovation at the heart of the country's new industrial policy by leading DTI's initiatives in preparing industries for the fourth industrial revolution, and also for advancing the digital transformation of MSMEs and large enterprises, establishing regional inclusive innovation centers, developing the country's creative industries, and growing a robust startup economy in the country. Ladies and gentlemen, our main discussant, Undersecretary Rafaelita Aldaba. You now have the floor, ma'am. I think Thank you are you so there. much. Thank you so much. Um, am I allowed to share the screen? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I have a short presentation. I have, I prepared uh, some slides which uh, I wish to share with uh, everyone as uh, we do a quick review of our new of our industrial policy journey. I mean, I'll try to compress uh, everything <laughs> within uh, um, 15, 15 minutes or so. So let me just uh, enlarge my screen. But good good morning, good morning, everyone. Um, especially uh, um, our to our former uh, DTI secretary, uh, 
Czech Cristobal, um, as well as uh, some of our colleagues. Uh, I was able to catch uh, the talk of uh, Dr. Tonia Trakisa, um, and I can see some of uh, our friends um, in, in the room, Dr. Fidel Nimenzo, Dr. Uh, Giovanni Tapang. Okay, so um, just, to, just to start, uh, in this table, I um, would like to show some figures uh, with respect to the question on whether um, the, the uh, structural changes that we uh, expected to happen with uh, the implementation of trade liberalization indeed uh, were realized. And uh, as you can see, we look at value added, we look at employment, we try to track uh, uh, the uh, indicators uh, for three periods. The average, these are averages from the 80s, the 90s, and the 20s, along with, um, uh, apart from the average growth, we also look at average share of uh, value added. And then uh, also with respect to the performance, the employment contribution of uh, specifically the manufacturing industry. And as you can see um, in the 80s, uh, it, the, it, it was a very, very uh, slow growth, less than 1% average. And then uh, in the 90s, uh, this went up to 2.5%. And in the 20s, to an average of 4.1%. Uh, Looking at uh, the GDP average during uh, the same period, it's one point. We, manufacturing is uh, still performing uh, below uh, the GDP uh, rates, 1.7 for, for the 80s, 3% for the 90s, 4.7 in the 20s. And looking at the contribution of manufacturing, during the 80s, it was 26.3%. Uh, in the 90s, this uh, went uh, down slightly, 24.3%. And in the 20s, not mu nothing much has changed. Um, the per in terms of uh, the contribution of uh, manufacturing, as you can see on the table, it's been quite stagnant, Three, 23 or around 24% average during the 20s. And in terms of its employment contribution, 9.9% average in the 80s, a slight increase. Uh, well, it's a very, very small <laughs> increase, 10%, um, in fact, negligible. 10% um, in uh, the 90s, and uh, again, a we're seeing a decline in the 20s to from 10 to 9.1% uh, percent contribution. And what, uh, which sector uh, has been uh, driving the economy? It's practically the services sector, whose average growth went up from 3.3% in the 80s to 5.8% in the 20s. And in terms of its average contribution to uh, GDP from 40%, this went up to 48% in the 20s. And at the same time, 36% um, 30, average uh, employment contribution. So it's practically absorbing um, those uh, workers uh, that are leaving uh, the other sectors along with uh, new entrants in the economy. So 41% average share in the 90s and close to 49% average share during the 20s. In terms of the performance of the agricultural sector, there's been a, a slight increase from 1.8% average growth in the 90s to 3% in the 20s. Although in terms of its contribution to GDP, we're also seeing a slight decline uh, from 24% in the 80s down to 21% in the 90s and to 19% in the 20s. Um, in terms of contribution to employment, there's also a declining trend from 50% in the 80s, 43% in the 90s, and 36% during the 20s. So uh, what we can conclude uh, from these figures is that there's really um, very little movement of uh, resources towards the manufacturing industry. The ex what we expected was with um, the implementation of trade liberalization, uh, we expected resources to move towards the industry. And uh, as you can see, 
in uh, from from uh, our figures and indicators this has not uh, really happened and uh, also while we were expecting uh, a strong performance as well as the the increase in um, employment, uh, as you can see, there's also a failure in terms of employment creation. And what's happening um, is that uh, with uh, liberalization, with the entry of cheaper um, imports, um, many of the companies uh, exited the manufacturing industry and they uh, went to higher uh, profits in the services sectors like wholesale and retail and real estate. And this is um, one of the reasons driving the strong growth of services. Um, while uh, we are also expecting uh, exports uh, to increase, but then um, it, it's, uh, it, it has been difficult because it is not easy to enter um, new export uh, markets. Of course, they would offer higher uh, profit opportunities, but only if you are a productive company who can pay the um, export market entry costs. In, uh, well, essentially what's, what has happened is that uh, there were no adjustment programs that uh, were implemented to support firms and workers that were affected by trade liberalization. I was able to catch uh, partly the presentation on uh, garments and textile. And uh, yeah, this is uh, one of the sectors that uh, was uh, really affected by the trade liberalization. It was uh, not able to cope uh, with uh, the rising um, uh, competition from imports, apart of course from um, uh, the smuggling issue, which has actually been a problem that only um, during uh, the 90s, but it's been there ever since. Um, we, what we were um, expecting was that uh, through the adjustment programs, uh, reskilling and upskilling of the workers could have happened, soft loans could have been provided along with uh, support incentives, for instance, in order to um, help companies conduct uh, their R&D so, so that they would be able to offer uh, better, uh, cheaper, or uh, more efficient uh, uh, processes and products. Um, also marketing support to help companies modernize and upgrade and uh, up, um, adopt new technologies to help them become uh, more productive and improve their efficiency. If we compare our experience uh, with uh, what uh, Thailand went through as it implemented its own trade liberalization. Thailand uh, accompanied its uh, gra gradual trade liberalization, trade and import liberalization with an industrial restructuring program, which was an adjustment program primarily to support the upgrading of uh, its companies, uh, the manufacturing firms um, in particular, help them improve their competitiveness by offering soft loans and technical assistance to uh, 13 industries that they identified as their priorities. And this was carried out through a uh, 1.19 billion US dollar uh, loan um, from the World Bank. And um, so let's try to look at uh, our productivity. Dr. Rakiza earlier uh, mentioned about the low labor productivity. This time, it's not only labor uh, productivity that we're measuring, but this is the total factor uh, productivity wherein we try to capture the productivity of all the factors of production. And as you can see, this uh, would cover the years from 1996 up to 2012. Um, overall, if you look at, uh, 2008, 2009, up to 2012, we can see the, an upward trend in terms of uh, the productivity of uh, the manufacturing industry. And then um, we also looked at the TFP or the total factor productivity of uh, the major uh, manufacturing subsectors, such as uh, machinery and equipment. And as you can see, uh, this, um, this is this sector along with uh, basic metals and electrical machinery, they've been doing quite well in terms of uh, productivity. As you can see on the slide, uh, the, an upward uh, 
uh, tra trajectory is uh, evident, uh, indicating um, a good performance uh, for ma machinery and equipment, along with the two other uh, sectors that uh, we've mentioned. As, as, you, as you can also notice, these are uh, sectors that are export oriented and they comprise uh, around, well, over 50% over of uh, the country's total exports. And they are uh, part of the global value chain of uh, uh, electronics uh, multinational companies. In the case of, uh, well, um, for wood and uh, products of wood, cork, along with furniture, and then you also have coke and refined uh, petroleum, uh, rubber, other non-metallic products, and uh, motor vehicles, and food beverages and tobacco products. Um, I, I would say that uh, the performance here in terms of their TFP would be uh, somewhat moderate. Um, and then uh, below manufacturing would be um, sectors such as paper and paper products, chemicals and chemical products, along with recycling. And then you also have textiles and garments, um, manufacture of luggage, handbags, and footwear, which as you can see, um, has a declining total factor productivity. And I think that explains the low competitiveness of the sector, uh, which was earlier uh, discussed. So it was against this background that we implemented the comprehensive national industrial strategy, wherein we identified initially top five uh, uh, priority sectors. We have manufacturing, we have infrastructure and logistics, agribusiness, especially those uh, focusing on high value crops, ITBPM. So it's not only uh, manufacturing, but we tried to um, prioritize uh, sectors. And uh, as you can see, they are all supportive of each other because the goal is really towards uh, linking together the different uh, sectors and ensure that uh, the gaps in the supply and value chain uh, would be addressed. And we carried out the manufacturing resurgence program. I'm 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 glad that uh, um, Sekche is here and he can probably uh, discuss this a lot more uh, later during his uh, presentation. But in terms, we were fortunate because uh, during uh, that time in 2014, for instance, we received a, a budget from uh, the government from GAA, the Ge General Appropriations Act. Initially. We received a budget of 60 million and, um, and then around 90 million in 2015 and around 111 uh, million pesos in 2016. Um, in most of our industries, it's not only in uh, textile and garments, uh, which are uh, disconnected, but as well as in other industries like copper, for instance, wherein you have a lot of missing linkages. Uh, for instance, we are uh, we have uh, um, copper ores, but 100% uh, of these are um, exported. Um, and then we have a, a smelting plant. We have we still have Pasar. Um, it uh, manufactures cathodes and section of cathode uh, products, but these are mostly exported. They are not uh, supplied locally to other um, segments that would uh, make use of. Uh, cathodes and cathodes and other cathode uh, products. And in terms of uh, the inputs that they use, they are not linked with our mining sector. Instead, they are importing heavily the concentrates that they use to um, uh, manufacture the cathode uh, products. Milling plants, uh, they are also like what we've said, uh, there is an X meaning there's no link, there's no connection between smelting and uh, our mill plants. And uh, most of the cathodes that they need are also imported. And um, on the, uh, the um, down down, uh, down uh, the the supply chain and value chain, we have uh, um, wiring harnesses. And uh, wiring harnesses, uh, they're also not sourcing the wires that they use, um, but instead these are uh, all um, imported, and then they export entirely their uh, production of uh, wiring harnesses using imported copper raw materials. 
And the same is true for uh, electronics. We do not have, uh, again, uh, we do not have um, wafer uh, fabrication uh, um, in the country. So um, um, one way uh, suggested, uh, the, the suggestion in order for us to move up the value chain is uh, via uh, the design, I see the integrated uh, circuit uh, design. Um, and right now there are a few, some, some uh, young players in, in the sector. And then mostly we are in this uh, stage of uh, the value chain package assembly and uh, final test. But we're still hoping. Uh, I know Dr. Dan Lachika is uh, also here. Uh, we can discuss this a lot more uh, maybe during his presentation. So um, given, uh, as we know, uh, there are um, new technologies uh, that we can adopt in order for us to um, improve our competitiveness. And at the same time, um, using these new technologies uh, to help uh, drive an inclusive, resilient, sustainable industrial development in the Philippines. By adopting these new technologies, this is uh, the framework that we're using. By adopting uh, these new technologies, we can introduce uh, new goods um, into the market through innovation. And uh, also we can increase our production efficiency by, um, by um, investing in smart uh, manufacturing. And um, by uh, um, adopting these new technologies, uh, we would be a, in a better position through innovation, through the introduction of new products. There would be uh, more jobs and income opportunities. New industries could emerge from uh, these new technologies along with uh, the introduction or the manufacturing of more environmental goods. And uh, through the adoption of these new technologies, our process could, be, uh, be, could, could become much more uh, efficient because these are uh, more uh, energy efficient uh, technologies and that could help drive our industrial competitiveness. And all of this together, uh, like what I've said, could lead to a more inclusive, sustainable, resilient industrial development. And this is uh, um, the new industrial uh, strategy that uh, we uh, have been implementing. It's called the IQS, Inclusive Innovation Industrial Strategy, the goal of which is to uh, create more dynamic, a more dynamic industry ecosystem. Uh, we are uh, focusing on these uh, six uh, pillars, embracing Industry 4.0 technologies, uh, supporting the growth of uh, and development of more innovative MSMEs and startups, integrating our production systems in such a way that uh, we would be able to address those gaps in the supply and value chain that uh, I've earlier discussed. And uh, this would also be crucial in terms of uh, in enabling our or deepening our participation in global value chain. Um, and of course, we also uh, need to promote uh, uh, and bridge the gaps between uh, our innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystems, upskilling and reskilling the workforce. This is very important and uh, in the, uh, creating a more enabling economic environment. Um, with respect to our vision for the future, through the, um, the adoption of these uh, new technologies, we would like to um, play um, a more uh, important role in sectors such as uh, e-gaming, smart assistance, digital health, which uh, is really very important, especially given our uh, experience during the pandemic, um, smart buildings, smart home technology, smart uh, factories, and smart uh, agriculture, adopting resilient technology, vehicle technology, and uh, audio, video, and uh, ed tech. Um, in terms of our programs uh, to support the industrial transformation um, of our manufacturing companies, uh, we, well, um, let me first emphasize that uh, we view um, the digital transformation as a journey, um, trying to capture all uh, the facets, um, including the people, the technology, and the organization. 
And we provide support through uh, Industry 4.0 uh, workshops, along with uh, the support that we provide to companies in terms of uh, crafting their own Industry 4.0 uh, roadmaps, along with uh, supporting um, them. Uh, the, the initial um, state, uh, initial uh, step that must be carried out in order for companies to shift would really be to conduct um, a smart uh, industry readiness uh, uh, assessment, which we are carrying out through the um, Smart Industry Readiness Index uh, Assessment. Um, and this, uh, we are in, in this activity, we are partnering not only with uh, the Asian Development Bank and the World Economic uh, Forum, but as well as with technology companies like uh, Siemens. Um, we are also um, planning to build um, an AI uh, center of uh, excellence. And last year we launched uh, the AI uh, roadmap, the goal of which is uh, to uh, help in terms of maintaining the regional and global competitiveness of local industries through the adoption of uh, AI. And uh, we've also identified key areas um, um, such as those in R&D and technology application for agriculture, as well as for uh, manufacturing, for health, as well as uh, uh, logistics and uh, other um, important sectors. Um, so, um, oh, I mentioned, uh, I, I think the priorities are in here, precision farming, autonomous vehicles, smart manufacturing, healthcare services, and uh, leveraging on our uh, strength in uh, IT BPM. We are uh, um, trying to promote an AI powered uh, business process outsourcing. And this is important because uh, through the um, through the establishment of the Center for AI Research, we would like to uh, provide more support in terms of accelerating the digital transformation um, of our um, MSMEs and uh, startups. Um, well, as we adopt these new technologies, of course, we need to reskill and upskill our workforce. Um, and, and hence, we are also, we, we have already started uh, implementing the Philippine Skills Framework uh, Initiative, which uh, serves as a common reference or language that employers and workers could use to ensure that uh, the jobs uh, skills mismatch problem is uh, addressed. And we've already finished uh, the PSF for logistics and supply chain, along with uh, the animation and uh, game development. And currently we're working with uh, other um, government agencies for uh, the crafting of the Philippine Skills Framework for electronics and manufacturing, along with uh, the ITBPM sectors. So uh, with respect to um, our new industrial strategy or uh, the I cubed S, we know that uh, this is a review, a review of course uh, is going to be crucial to help us in uh, shaping our future industrial policy, um, especially now uh, that uh, we are still recovering from the impact of the pandemic and the recession, the, the uh, resulting recession um, and uh, hence, our focus is really towards a more transformative uh, economic recovery through the adoption of digital technologies. And uh, um, our, our uh, main strategy is really the adoption of uh, an inclusive, innovative uh, industrialization strategy. And um, there is, uh, uh, as we all know, the corporate recovery and tax incentives for enterprises or the CREATE Act is now offering uh, a menu of incentives for our strategic uh, industries. And in fact, the CREATE is uh, providing the highest uh, level of incentives to uh, activities or, uh, or projects that would uh, uh, be uh, bringing uh, new technologies or new products, including new processes. And uh, we all know that uh, these new technologies are important for our uh, economic recovery, along with uh, the reduction of carbon footprints, uh, the adoption of clean technology uh, solutions, as well as uh, the adoption of new business models. I think uh, I've already uh, highlighted uh, 
the main priorities that would be, of course, smart manu agriculture, advanced manufacturing, and knowledge-based uh, economy. But that does not mean that uh, we're not going to incentivize uh, the other sectors which are not uh, yet uh, utilizing these new technologies. There would still be uh, incentives available for other sectors which are vital um, in order for us to uh, quickly uh, recover and build uh, our, our uh, industries. Um, and in particular, we would like uh, to attract more investments towards those uh, activities and sectors uh, which are currently being imported. Okay, so the goal is really to build a robust industrial base um, and invest through these incentives and other uh, support that uh, we are providing. We would like to attract more companies to invest in R&D for us to uh, create a more robust startup ecosystem, build more modern infrastructure. And uh, again, I, I would like to emphasize the need for human resource uh, development. And here is uh, actually the, um, um, the framework uh, that we are um, about to implement um, given the review or the stock taking that uh, we've carried out. Um, this is uh, the new uh, inclusive in innovative industrialization that we would like to implement. Of course, the overall, the ultimate goal is a shared prosperity for all and uh, for us to be able to alleviate poverty and inequality in the country. There are three major um, goals that we are looking at. Um, you can see in here the gray colored uh, um, boxes. Um, number one would be capital accumulation. So we would like to uh, accumulate and attract uh, more investments, especially those uh, that would uh, go into uh, or bring in um, uh, more investments towards uh, advanced digital production, along with uh, investments in R&D, in innovation, as well as in uh, uh, promoting and uh, promoting our human resource development, more uh, trainings and capacity building to uh, reskill and upskill our workforce um, towards uh, new and future skills, inclu including um, improve, um, improvements of uh, our research uh, skills. And this is important in order for us to um, build our science, technology, and innovation production capabilities. The second is uh, structural transformation. And um, as a measure of uh, whether uh, structural transformation is going to take place, um, we uh, would like to see an increase in the GDP share of more knowledge and science and technology innovation intensive sectors, and hence uh, the need for us to attract more investments that would bring in uh, the Industry 4.0 technologies, the integration of our production systems to address the, um, the, um, the gaps in the supply and value chain mentioned earlier, and of course, clean and efficient uh, production. And uh, the third is, uh, of course, by uh, carrying out uh, these two uh, important goals. The third would be the inclusive, innovative industrialization or IQPS that we are pursuing. We would like to diversify our exports and deepen our global value chain participation. At the same time, we need to expand our domestic market base, um, um, also programs and uh, policies that would um, enable us to transform our regions from uh, traditional agriculture to more modern agribusiness towards uh, um, the, the more investments as well in uh, light manufacturing, along with uh, move, the movement of workers from the informal towards the formal sector. And on uh, the next uh, um, row, you can see the various priorities that uh, we've identified. Um, sectors to help us rebuild the economy, like uh, food security, agriculture, health, water, infra, education, and so on. We've also identified another group um, uh, of activities to help us build a more competitive and resilient uh, economy. And this would include green ecosystems, defense, security, integrated steel, steel and textile, chemicals, plastic, 
uh, wafer fabrication, renewable energy, and the third would be activities to accelerate the country's transformation. So the adoption of uh, advanced manufacturing technologies, high-tech agriculture and biotech, smart manufacturing, promoting the blue economy, the creative economy, and more R&D. So we're uh, doing this, um, the, the incentives uh, to these sectors would be pr provided through the CREATE. And this is uh, being done through the strategic investment priority plan that would uh, pro be providing both horizontal and uh, policy measures in order to help us um, build uh, our uh, capabilities, especially in terms of uh, the adoption of all these new uh, technologies that would catalyze industrial development and digital transformation. Okay. So this is my uh, last slide. Uh, th this is um, still evolving. I'm actually in the process of still um, trying to um, write a more comprehensive uh, analysis of uh, our uh, new industrial policy journey. And um, these are, um, yeah, well, some bullets, bullet points that uh, I, I would like to share. Number one, um, yes, we have implemented trade liberalization. Um, in the 80s and uh, as well as in the 90s. But as our experience has shown, um, yes, there were increases in competition that could uh, enhance both innovation and productivity gains. But um, as seen from our experience, th these gains from competition and trade liberalization are not automatic. And hence, uh, especially given our developing country context, uh, which is characterized by uh, failures, market failures, coordination failures, and including government failures, the process of um, upgrading and diversification has not been easy. Um, there are two important challenges faced by our manufacturers. Number one, given our low tariff rates in most products, and hence they are faced with intense competition from imports in the domestic market. And uh, for those that are uh, export oriented, um, they of course need to improve their capacity so as to be able to penetrate more export markets. And even participation in global value chains of multinationals is not easy. And, um, and hence, uh, um, how to take advantage of the increasing returns to scale and market access opportunities from FTAs and increasing regional and global integration um, government has to provide support to both uh, import to, to both uh, domestic local manufacturers as well as to exporters. Given all these challenges that uh, must be faced, and our new industrial policy, therefore, um, is trying to align the integration of industry development with our trade and investment, along with human resource development, and hence the focus on. Um, attracting more investments and trying to take advantage of our um, FTAs and ensuring that our uh, local manufacturers and exporters are competitive in order to su survive the strong competition, not only against imports, but uh, as well as other uh, competitors out there in the, in the global market. And to do this, of course, it's really important for us to strengthen our human resources, our human capital, and, and so the focus in terms of investing in human resource development, um, especially in those areas and skills that uh, I've mentioned earlier. Um, and then um, the, the implementation of our new industrial policy, of course, would require a lot of coordination uh, among, among the different government agencies, um, but as well as with uh, um, the industry, with uh, um, the academe, along with other uh, stakeholders in society. We need to ensure that our trade and investment promotion policies are aligned in terms of promoting our industrial uh, development um, and focusing in terms of attracting more foreign direct investment that would bring in new technologies and would um, enable us to upgrade the country's global value chain participation. We did not actually reinvent the wheel. 
and uh, foreign direct investment could help us a lot in terms of uh, jumping towards uh, these um, new activities through the use of uh, new technologies. And uh, in this transition phase, the role of the government would be crucial. And hence, um, particularly, it would be important to coordinate the investments, uh, um, in particular, uh, to, for us to address the lack of the necessary infrastructure, along with the complementary inputs to enable us to successfully uh, attract and grow these new um, industries. I think I'm going to uh, stop there and uh, I uh, would be happy to address uh, questions and the discussions later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Yusek Aldaba, uh, for uh, jump-starting the uh, specifics and the dis of the discussion. Uh, but before we proceed to the panel discussion, uh, we would like to call on uh, the uh, secretary. Uh, um, we'd like to call on uh, uh, secretary of the Department of Science and Technology, uh, Secretary Fortunato Tanseco de la Peña, uh, who has been serving as the Secretary of the Department of Science and Technology since 2016. Let me just give you a few, uh, uh, an introduction about him. He obtained his uh, BS Chemical Engineering and MS in Industrial Engineering degrees from the University of the Philippines. Uh, he taught uh, Industrial Engineering and Operations Research at the UP College of Engineering for 43 years from 1973 to 2016, while also serving on a secondment basis at the DOST occupying various positions between 1982 to 2011. He served as Vice President for Planning and Development at the University of the Philippines and as Under Secretary of the DOST prior to his retirement in 2014. Secretary de la Peña was appointed as DOST Secretary in 2016 and was President of the following organizations, the Philippine Institute of Chemical Engineers, the Association of Management and Industrial Engineers of the Philippines, the Philippine Association for Advancement for the Advancement of Science and Technology, and the National Research Council of the Philippines. Session from 2011 to 2012. He received awards from the Professional Regulation Com Commission, the Civil Service Commission, the Career Executive Service Board, and the UP Alumni Engineers, the UP College of Engineering, and the UP Alumni Association, and the Ateneo de Manila University. In 2018, the University of the Philippines conferred to him the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Secretary of the OST, Secretary Fortunato de la Peña, you now have the platform, Secretary. Magandang umaga sa ating lahat. Uh, actually, ako ay mayroong uh, uh, closing remarks na nakahanda na. At uh, yun ay, uh, ang kinutukoy doon ay yung paggawa ng mga roadmaps sa uh, industry na nabanggit ni Yusek uh, Pita Aldaba ngayon-ngayon lang. Uh, actually, yan ay uh, collaborative work uh, ng uh, iba't ibang ahensya, uh, particular ang DTI at DOST, uh, kasama rin ang DICT, at uh, syempre yung mga uh, nasa ating private industry uh, sector. So, uh, binabati ko ang uh, UP sa pag-organize nitong uh, activity na ito. At uh, hindi ko na iisa-isahin ang aking babatiin, pero nagpapasalamat ako sa Pangulong uh, Danny Concepcion at sa uh, Chancellor Fidel Nemenso sa pag-imbita sa akin. Uh, ako kasi ay pal palipad na patungong takloban kaya uh, yung aking closing remarks ay naka-record naka, ano na, naka na at gusto ko lang uh, magbigay ng ilang uh, maikling pananlita tungkol naman doon sa mga objectives nitong ating event na ito. Yung uh, taking stock of uh, uh, how industry and how manufacturing is at the moment Yan ay bahagi noong uh, road mapping uh, exercise natin. At uh, yun nga ay uh, isa sa yun ang aking tinalakay dun sa aking nagawing closing remarks. Now, as far as uh, possible areas of collaboration are concerned, uh, marami actually uh, areas of collaboration at uh, siguro pinaka-prominent na ngayon yung aming components ng uh, 
uh, Science for Change program sa Department of Science and Technology, uh, unang-una ay uh, may component yon ng uh, academic industry collaboration na kung saan uh, yung uh, proposal na ginagawa ng isang uh, enterprise at na isang university uh, in partnership with its other ay uh, binibigyan namin ng uh, Uh, kaukulang kontribusyon para magawa yung research and development addressing the problem or the uh, objective uh, that they want to uh, uh, accomplish. And uh, siguro isang magandang halimbawa niyan ay ang uh, collaboration ng ating uh, College of Home Economics, ano? uh, yung kanilang uh, grupo dyan sa uh, food technology na ang kakolaborate nila ay ang uh, Batangas Egg Producers Cooperative. At uh, ang output niyan ay napakaraming mga makabago at inaubating na produkto. Ang uh, pa- pangalawang babanggitin kong component ay yung uh, tinatawag naming RD Leaders Program na kung saan na uh, uh, ipinipild natin ang uh, mga mahuhusay nating researchers at scientifico, mga engineers sa ibang uh, institusyon, particular na yung mga universities outside of uh, Metro Manila And uh, this this would be a big help to them in uh, planning their uh, research and development program, uh, particularly since many of them have uh, been assisted by DOST in setting up the so-called uh, niche uh, uh, R&D centers in the regions under our so-called NICER uh, program. At uh, ang uh, isa pa ay yung uh, pagtulong namin din sa kanila sa mga enterprises na gusto nang uh, magkaroon ng sariling R&D or R&D program sa kanilang uh, uh, kumpanya at kulang lamang sila ng uh, uh, ikanga eh, ng ng uh, facilities at saka ng software at pagtulong namin sa kanila doon sa aming uh, small enterprise technology upgrade program na binabayaran naman nila yung ina-advance namin pera sa pag-acquire nila ng software and uh, hardware ngayon Uh, ano ang pwede nating uh, maging uh, uh, collaborative uh, experience na hindi naman kailangan gumastos sa so, no ito ay wini-welcome namin ang UP Diliman uh, faculty uh, to uh, get involved in these programs pero uh, kung uh, actually kahit observer lang ma- ma-experience lang nila yung ginagawa namin uh, sa pagtulong sa ating mga industriya ano so nandiyan nga yung small enterprise technology upgrading program Nandiyan yung Cradle Program na Collaborative R&D uh, to leverage the economy. Nandiyan yung RD Leaders. Nandiyan yung uh, uh, Business Innovation uh, through, sci- for sci- through Science and Technology. At nandiyan din yung aming uh, Technology Business uh, Incubation and Acceleration Program. Yung Startup Assistance Program as provided by the uh, Innovative Startup Act. At nandiyan din yung aming uh, Technology Innovation for Commercialization Program. Uh, kung papaano uh, tinutulungan yung mga researcher na nagkaroon ng magandang resulta sa kanilang uh, research na iyan ay mai makakross ano uh, towards commercialization dahil yan ay uh, hindi madaling uh, uh, stage ano na, na yung pagtawid mula doon sa R&D from the lab uh, to the commercialization uh, uh, scale at uh, siguro babanggitin ko rin na uh, ang uh, isa naming uh, Pinagtuunan ng pansin ay uh, since kami sa DOST ay bahagi ng uh, uh, economic development cluster ng cabinet ay nag-participate kami actively in coming up with the so-called uh, 10-point action plan na irerekomenda sa uh, susunod na administrasyon. At uh, itong sampu na ito ay uh, uh, siguro very very quickly babasahin ko lang uh, Ensure macroeconomic stability with greater attention to expanding fiscal space. Uh, promote financial inclusion, access to credit, microinsurance. Number three is to ensure energy security. Number four is to fast track infrastructure, regional connectivity, and build, build, build. Number five is improve governance, e-government, simplify business to government and uh, uh, citizen to government transaction. Number six is ensure, ensure low food price inflation, improve agricultural productivity. Number seven is promote science, technology, and innovation. Number eight is accelerate digital transformation and other related supply-side interventions, industry clustering, 
and others. Uh, and uh, to, nine is to improve education systems, particularly on the technical skill side and on the apprenticeship side. And lastly, number 10 is promote climate action, renewable energy modernization of our public utility vehicles. Um, uh, some of these are actually uh, considered uh, uh, significantly in the so-called uh, uh, clustering of our industry roadmaps. And that is actually the topic of my closing remark. So, nagpapasalamat ako buli at sa lahat ng ating resource persons, napakaganda ng ating mga contribution, at I am sure that this will lead to something very good as far as our uh, Pilabid University is concerned in trying to help industry and the economy. Maraming pong salamat. Maraming salamat po, uh, Secretary De La Peña, for sharing the efforts of the uh, Department of Science and Technology with respect to aligning and connecting science and technology, R&D, and uh, industry development. Thank you, po, sir. Uh, and now we move on to the uh, panel discussion. Uh, let me please allow me to uh, introduce first our uh, panelists. Uh, who are going to be also joined by Yusek Aldaba, who spoke earlier. Uh, we have uh, in our panel discussants, uh, Mr. Menileo Carlos III. Uh, he is the president of the Shipyards Association of the Philippines, as well as the Philippine Iron Construction and Marine Works Incorporated. He also uh, previously served as the vice president for manufacturing of the RI Chemical Corporation and as president of the Samahan sa Pilipinas ng mga industriyang kemika. So uh, good morning, sir. Uh, thank you for joining the panel. Our second panelist is attorney Adrian Cristobal Jr., uh, who is a former secretary of the Department of Trade and Industry and Chairman of the Board of Investments of the Philippines. In government, he also served as DTI Undersecretary for uh, Industry Development and Trade Policy and Vice Chair uh, and Managing Head of BOI, Director General of the Intellectual Property Office of the Philippines and DTI Undersecretary for Consumer Welfare. After his government service, Attorney Cristobal joined Steel Asia Manufacturing Corporation as its uh, President and later Vice Chairman. He was a director in the board of the Federation of Philippine Industries. He was also former chairman of the governing board of the Economic Research Institute of ASEAN and East Asia, the think tank of ASEAN. Currently, Attorney Cristobal is in the private practice of law, consults, and teaches at the Ateneo de Manila uh, Law School. Uh, good morning, Attorney uh, uh, Cristobal. Uh, our uh, next panelist uh, is uh, Dr. Danilo Lachica. Uh, he is the president of Semiconductor and Electronics Industries in the Philippines Foundation Incorporated, the association representing the electronics industry, which accounts for 60% of uh, the total Philippine commodity exports and employs over 3 million direct and indirect workers. Dr. La Chica has over 40 years of senior management experience in semiconductors, electronics, and consumer goods manufacturing, uh, 16 of which were in front-end semiconductor wafer manufacturing in Silicon Valley. He returned to the Philippines as an expatriate managing director of a U.S. company with factories in the Philippines and Malaysia. Uh, good morning, Dr. La Chica. Our uh, next panelist is uh, Engineer Rafael Nestor Mantaring. Uh, he has more than 40 years of combined experience in the academe and industry. His experience in the academe culminated when he became chair of the Electrical Engineering Department, now Electronics and in Electronics Engineering Institute of the UP College of Engineering. He is former president of Rome LSI Design Philippines, a Japanese owned a technology company involved in the design and development of integrated circuits and also headed the IMI Ayala Technology Development Initiative and the Platform Development Group of EAZIX, E6 Incorporated. Engineer Mantaring likewise headed the design and development for Asia and Integrated Microelectronics Incorporated or IMI, a global electronic manufacturing solutions provider with manufacturing and engineering oper operations in the Philippines, China, Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, 
Mexico, and the USA. He is currently a professorial lecturer and consultant in electronics product development. Uh, good morning to uh, engineer Rafael Mantarin. Good morning to each and everyone. So uh, this is our panel discussion. Uh, we've heard earlier on from our speakers and also from our main discussant, uh, Undersecretary Aldaba, who is also part of this panel, um, a lot of points from how they uh, have identified problems and challenges uh, to uh, propose solutions, even uh, active government policies. Um, probably just a general question for everyone. Uh, and uh, we probably call on uh, who would like to raise their hand, who would like to go first. What are your takeaways? What uh, struck you most uh, uh, in the earlier discussions presented to us? Uh, anyone can probably uh, comment and uh, start the discussion. Anyone? Your takeaways or your impressions? Everyone's shy, so I can start. I can... Yes, go ahead, sir. Go ahead, Dr. La Chica. Okay, well, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge Secretary Boyd de la Peña and he said that they're the staunch supporters of the electronics industry, among others. Also to uh, Chancellor Fidel for the invitation. And his mom, who used to be my Philippine Science High School teacher, I understand she's in the audience. Uh, also, thanks to uh, uh, former Secretary uh, Che. Uh, he was actually responsible for, you know, I, I think something like 30 uh, industry roadmaps, including the electronics industry during his term. Um, so anyway, let me just uh, go through some of my notes here. For Dean uh, Tapang, I would encourage the Dean to kind of uh, take a look, take a second look at uh, some industries, in particular, the electronics industry, because uh, you know some of the things that he said, we rarely do innovation, no R&D activity in local firms, electronics is low value add. I think those are dated information that he needs to probably refresh, okay? For uh, uh, Dr. Dinoga, uh, I, uh, I recognize the need for industry academy uh, partnership. In fact, with SAPI, we do have uh, an associate members uh, group, which is made up of 35 university members and we partnered them up with uh, industry participants for R&D, OJT and other collaborative projects. For Dr. Rakisa, for her seven, uh, seven recommendations, one of them was tax reform, but I think what uh, could have been added there also was the incentives rationalization. Uh, create is good. Uh, as uh, Yusek Tita mentioned, um, the reduction of corporate income tax to 25% was probably long overdue. The concern that the industry has is with the incentives rationalization. Um, you know, we have high operating costs in the Philippines. You know, the uh, logis logistics cost is like, the power cost is about 40% higher, logistics about 10 to 20% higher even labor cost is higher, right? And so if you were the CEO of a multinational, where would you put your facility? Uh, of course, you will choose the country that has the least operating cost uh, other than having a friendly environment. And the concern really is that uh, we are not anywhere close to competitive operating costs. I mean, yes, we can say pat ourselves on the back, and say that the FDIs last year were like 50% higher than the year before, but I think that's not the appropriate measure. Um, it's a feel good measure, but I think what we need to look at is that what FDIs is the Philippines getting compared to Vietnam or Thailand or Malaysia or Indonesia? I mean, if you look at the numbers, and I, I know you said Pete and I had discussions on this, but uh, uh, the reality is we're not getting, like for example, Vietnam, our biggest competitor for uh, investments, we're only uh, reaching about 20% of their levels, right? 
So my recommendation would be is for the new administration to uh, look at the root cause um, other than the operating costs. What are the other reasons why we're not getting as much F, uh, FDIs compared to the organization and then address them accordingly. As far as USEC PETA, we're, we're so thankful for USEC PETA uh, and uh, SECMON for being supportive, not only of the electronics industry, but other industries. I mean, uh, you know, the support of innovation of late industry 4.0, um, our industry, well, maybe as a background, the electronics industry accounted for uh, $45.9 billion of electronics exports last year, which is uh, actually 6% uh, higher than the pre-pandemic level. So we've recovered, and again, uh, big thanks to uh, DPI and DOSP and of course IATF. It could have been more, it could have been more. Uh, we did have a shortage of semiconductor wafers, uh, but nonetheless, because of the uh, demand for the, we talked about the emerging technologies, we actually recovered. We employ over 3 million direct and indirect workers. And none of this uh, would have been possible. Of course, we can say that the companies did their jobs, but without the support of DPI, without the support of DOSD, mm -hmm. um, or even IATF with the vaccines, right? Uh, that, none of that would have been possible. So some of the needs of our industry, uh, USEC PETA mentioned that uh, uh, part of uh, what they have in SIPP is a wafer fab. I'd love to have a wafer fab in the Philippines. That's what I did in Silicon Valley. But unfortunately, our power is too expensive. The quality is bad. Water is too expensive. Um, so we have to look at other means uh, to be able to address that. And again, uh, one of the ways we are looking at is, uh, again, thanks to DTI for funding the electronics industry roadmap and for DOSD for administering it. If you look at the different sectors, uh, uh, semiconductors accounts for 70% of those exports. We cannot move down the value chain. We can't build a wafer fab. So as uh, Yusek Pita mentioned, we're gonna move up uh, to IC design, uh, not as a, uh, uh, critical in terms of power demand or water uh, cooling water, but we do have a lot of engineers. Uh, DTI has an IC design roadmap that we're supporting, but an integral part of that also is having a lab scale wafer fab to do the prototyping instead of uh, sending to Taiwan and you know higher cost, uh, longer lead time, and even intellectual property protection risks, right? So uh, we're working on that. And of course, for IR 4.0, uh, we have a technical working group. We're initially looking at the manufacturing companies and understanding the, understanding the capabilities and the, the uh, knowledge with IR 4.0. What we learn from there, and again, this is supported by DPI, um, what we're learning from, what we learn from that, I should say, we will share with DPI, we will share with other industries who are willing to learn. So as a country, we can grow and leverage and accelerate this digital transformation journey, which you know, will benefit the country, will benefit the industries. Uh, so it's kind of like benchmarking and accumulate the best knowledge from you know, all quarters, including the electronics industry and uh, help each other in uh, further improving the economy. So uh, we have other plans for the electronics roadmap, looking at other technologies that are not uh, currently being done. Um, EV for sure, uh, batteries for the renewable energy, et cetera. But that's mm -hmm. another conversation yeah. and I don't want to monopolize this. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lachika. Perhaps a reaction from uh, uh, any of our panelists on uh, the issues that were raised uh, by Dr. Lachika, uh, constraints, <laughs> probably uh, in the uh, development of particular sectors because of cost uh, or something that you'd like to raise. Uh, anyone? Um, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I, I, yeah, I yes. agree with no, no. I agree okay, with so. Diana, no, because um, we've been talking about uh, technology solutions to to manufacturing problems, 
But for me, really, the, the bigger problem is not technology. You know, it's it's the enabling environment for business here. You know, the infrastructure problems, the ease of doing business problems. Uh, what else? You no, know, the uh, uh, regulatory uncertainties that that exist in the country. You know, the slow judicial system, slow regulatory decisions, and uh, I, I think uh, one big thing, no, uh, corruption. I guess no, which which makes the competitive. Uh, landscape in the Philippines really, really poor, no? We've been talking a lot about uh, all of this uh, technology, which is well and good, it's needed, but uh, there should be equal effort in, in, in these other areas. Thank you very much, Engineer Mantaring. Uh, Attorney Cristobal, your thoughts, sir, uh, particularly on the enabling yes. environment. Yeah, yes, ahead. I think uh, Engineer Mantaring gave me that uh, opening here. No? Um, the presentations are really excellent. Um, and uh, the slides showing garments, uh, copper, uh, and, and there are many other slides, you know, like uh, steel, electronics that show the supply chain. And when these studies first came out in 2012, 2013, uh, we at the DTI-BOI were kind of uh, surprised to see the huge, the gaps and the depth of the of what was lacking no, in our industries uh, i'll just share a, a bit i'll just look back a bit and uh, how this started just to put things in context no, very briefly uh, the enthusiasm is of course uh, important that we continue and uh, fita is amazing undaunted by what Tonet calls the herculean tasks that uh, this prop, this policy, this program has had to face from the start. In 2012, when B DTI BI launched the industry development program and uh, or relaunched it and brought it back to life, uh, it was not a proclamation of national government policy, as probably many thought. That was a a announcement by by the department of a shift in public policy, in economic policy. And the task of lobbying and advocating uh, not just the external environment, the sectors, but more important within government was just about to begin. And that's normally or mainly within the economic development cluster. So to give you an idea, it took two years for the CARS program, the Automotive uh, Resurgence Strategy Program, to gather support in the NDC. This is Finance, NEDA, and the uh, Department of Budget Management, and eventually the approval of the president. So um, you have economic thinking clashing, uh, philosophies clashing, every Every component of the program, every peso had to be, of incentives had to be defended. No? So uh, my, my point is, is that government is, uh, is not a leviathan. It is not a monolith of one mind marching to the same uh, beat. It's uh, the, this industry policy uh, in government is, not something certain now. It's just been 10 years. Uh, DOST, Dole, they've been very supportive. Uh, Secretary Boy and FITA is carrying the torch as far as it can go. But again, it's just been 10 years. And the conditions now, uh, after this, uh, during, after this pandemic, the fiscal situation now compared to then is very different. So this would affect uh, any kind of major incentive package, I think, as we were able to obtain for cars at the time. No? I'm just glad to hear from Secretary Peña that one of the 10 points of the uh, economic agenda includes a uh, not merely just a stable macroeconomic uh, environment or fiscal policy, but likewise to continue expanding because we were able to do that because of the, the fiscal uh, space that uh, was able to 
to be created at that time. And so it's the politics behind industrial policy is something. Uh, I think the RA 11.534 or create law uh, may have, yes, better incentives, but for the first time no, in a long time, we have a uh, body, a super body, the Fiscal Incentives Review Board that actually regulates and even audits, I think, I mean, the way it's worded, the incentive administration uh, system in the country. And the chair there is the OF. Now, in the 80s, Chalmers Johnson came up with a seminal work on the Ministry of International Trade and Industry of Japan, the growth of industrial policy for 50 years. And he was, I think, the first to record how the dynamics within the cabinet is really between the MITI and the Ministry of Finance. And depending on which minister was more powerful or influential, depending on the political economic conditions, uh, one point of view dominated the other in different periods of Japan's growth. Now, I think that's normal in any country in that with a democratic system like this. So what we've had is the same process, but with the FIRB, it is now the Department of Finance that is dominant and it's institutionalized, it's more or less permanent. Uh, I think that will also affect the kind of industrial policy we have, we will have uh, moving forward. Uh, second, I can also appreciate the, the comments of, of Dr. Akisa about the need to, for a high capacity yet uh, pragmatic development of state. No? Um, the truth of the matter is the government bureaucracy has hollowed out for many decades. Uh, the salaries of government uh, employees have not been able to keep up with the standards of living, much less keep pace with the private sector since the 1970s or 1980s. So what you had were really technical people just leaving and, and joining the private sector who would also actively recruit them. And um, early retirement programs that were meant to downsize the bureaucracy just ended up having the relatively younger and very competent uh, bureaucrats leave for a second career or put up their own businesses. So I think that was an unintended consequence of early retirement programs. And then uh, um, finally, uh, I think the private sector, one of the presenters did the uh, question why the richest companies uh, engage in relatively safer investments, real estate, banking, uh, and so on. So I, I think the economic elite is not without responsibility in, in our present state. Perhaps a clearer industrial policy would uh, encourage them to get into high risk manufacturing or uh, agriculture manufacturing, perhaps. But there are still a few there in uh, steel or with us now, Petrochem, uh, where you have a few industrial uh, leaders who are not asking for any more incentives than than they have now, but just ask you for a playing field. So then that's the a level playing field. So that's the, then a question of our own elite's commitment to industrializing the country. So I just, um, those are my, my reactions to, to the presentations. Thank you very much, you. Uh, Attorney Thank you. For, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, and before I ask uh, our panelists, about a particular that particular matter regarding uh, curriculum and industry alignment, which is also of interest and was raised uh, during this webinar. I see uh, uh, Mr. Carlos's uh, head nodding earlier on. Uh, uh, may may we get your thoughts, sir, on the matter? Uh, perhaps your reactions as well. 
Yes, hi. Uh, thanks again for inviting me. Uh, thank you to uh, Secretary de la Peña and, and Secretary Cristobal and Undersecretary uh, Aldaba and uh, Chancellor Nemenso for inviting us as well as everyone else. Um, I fully agree uh, with what was said by the other discussants, uh, Dr. Chica and Engineer Mantaring. Um, from our point of view, shipyards, uh, instead, of a, instead of a wafer fab, what we've been uh, asked about is, hey, what about a steel rolling mill or, a, or an integrated steel mill? Why, why can't we have that in the Philippines? Um, and my perennial answer to them was, do you realize how much volume you need to push through a steel mill <laughs> to make it economically viable? Um, and when I tell them the volumes, then they sort of uh, have to recalibrate their expectations. And then I tell them the same thing. I said, there are many other ways for us to be competitive, but we also have to realize our limitations. So just like what was mentioned earlier, um, power is an extremely high cost uh, extremely high cost in the Philippines. Uh, if I remember right, we were second only to Tokyo. Uh, at one point, we might still be, or we might even be more expensive by now. Um, and it's very challenging for us to require or to push integration in all directions. So we do, in, 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 a, in a liberalized global economy, we do have to essentially pick our battles. Um, what I did see is that with the different plans. And I'm, I'm very glad for the next topic, by the way, the, the curriculum issue in the, in the education, because that's actually one thing that uh, I was focusing on myself, is I noticed that if, if you look back, uh, why did companies invest in the Philippines? It's because we had a natural resource available. We had people. And at the time, they were fairly well educated. Our com competitors were arguably less so. And we had that push coming out of the 70s and 80s and 90s. Now, one thing I think that even the garment sector would, would appreciate is you have a lot more competition on the market that has actually eaten up your market share. It's, it, there's, it's not just uh, government inaction or, or, uh, or private investment, uh, lack of modernization that brought us down from second place to, to something else. No, uh, to ninth place on as far as manufacturing exports or to 30th uh, in the world. W definitely, uh, our competition has cleaned up their act and picked up and improved their game. China is uh, now the, the world's largest economy or almost. Um, you know, you've got Vietnam coming from way behind the Philippines 20 years ago, and now they are zooming past us, I think, at, at a rate that is very impressive. At the same time, uh, difficult to compete with. But what we should do is we should lay the groundwork to become more competitive in the future. So I think that while it's uh, very laudable to include uh, MSMEs in our planning, um, we should also look at other ways to incentivize or to promote uh, both local content and inclusivity. Um, case in point, uh, shipyard industry, uh, DBP uh, was giving loans out to ship owners. So I will upset several ship owners uh, with, with some of my comments, but, um, and they promptly took that money, went abroad and bought the vessels there and, and are bringing them into the Philippines to apply the Philippine trade. So let's get this right. Philippine money brought to another country to buy ships, brought imported in, back into the Philippines to make money off of Filipinos or Philippine trade. It's that, that kind of cycle has to stop. Or at the very least, uh, a, a preference for local manufacturing, local content to be able to participate in these things. Uh, I always welcome foreign investment. Uh, it's always nice for them to see a resource in the Philippines and then to make use of it. However, uh, we might want to start considering asking for local participation or content as well. Not just everything's imported, use our labor, and then export everything again afterwards. I think that, that somehow that uh, equation has to change. But, and then definitely the solution is not going to be a single area. Um, I know I'm very glad that, uh, that Secretary Kristova mentioned the CARS program. Uh, I, uh, had a lot of discussions with uh, Henry Ko about that. 
um, when we when he was uh, conceptualizing a maritime industrial park. Um, but I would go even further. I would go for uh, a complete domestic manufacturing law that allows us to be competitive in the manufacturing field in the Philippines, but not necessarily only for export. We should re I mean, uh, right now you can export 70% mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, avail of the PESA incentives or become, you, you know, if you're in the right location and if that's where your investment is. But how does that help people manufacturing for the domestic market or 50-50 domestic market and foreign market? Uh, oftentimes the foreign market will follow once you have a product or uh, and establish a quality and pass all sorts of criteria. Um, but our bread and butter is and should be the domestic market. Uh, so if we don't start considering ways to incentivize the consumption of domestically manufactured goods as well, then I think we will forever be an importing economy. Uh, and this goes not just for manufactured goods, it goes clearly to, even towards agricultural uh, self-sufficiency, food, food security and, and sustainment. Um, I wasn't able to note who made the presentation about the labor uh, component of the different industri industries, right? But um, definitely services is right up there now. They're almost at 50%, at least as far as the, the table shown was concerned. Um, and then agricultural agriculture is at 35% of, of the labor pool and 15% for industrial. Um, I just did some quick Googling and checked how, you know, the U.S. has a very uh, active agricultural market. And it, then I wonder how much of that market, how much of their labor force is in the agriculture sector, right? They can export their wheat to all over the world. They export their manufactured goods uh, everywhere. How much, how much labor uh, of the U.S. labor market is is in agriculture? And the answer is 0.8%, uh, 0.8%. So if we want to think of ourselves as a, let's say a more advanced or modern economy, we, we have to be prepared yeah. to employ, maybe maybe 0 0.8 is not practical for the Philippines. I mean, I, I can only imagine so many things keeping us from hitting that number or, or uh, you know, CARP is definitely one of them. Right, you 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 have a ton of small farmers. Of course, they're gonna they're they're going to be a part of the labor pool, but at the same time, we have to be prepared to let's say redirect thirty percent of the thirty five percent to other areas. Is it going to go to, go to servicing? Is it going to go to industrial? And if it goes to industrial, mm -hmm. where are we going to employ them? Right. So, in as much as you might, we might see uh, large employment numbers in industry, if, if we want to achieve a modern economy, we have to be prepared to possibly hit 45% for industrial. And if we want to be efficient in food, food self-sufficiency, we may have to wake up to the fact that we can't keep employing one out of every three working age Filipinos in the food sector. Uh, we have to be more efficient. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carlos. Uh, some of the things that you've raised uh, uh, were also actually uh, part of the core questions. Um, but I mentioned earlier, um, the, on the matter particularly of the alignment between curriculum and industry and now the implications of that to employment, uh, I'd like to raise that as a, as a as a topic, I think, and we'd like to get your thoughts about it. First, it was, uh, uh, I think, Dean Tapang earlier who mentioned um, that, uh, you know, th there's that factor also of the employment opportunities for our scientists and experts. Uh, and the job market for them uh, is quite thin. And then uh, also uh, that other point that was raised earlier by Yusek Aldaba, uh, explaining or, or basically informing us about that the movement towards the services sector uh, of uh, some that are in the manufacturing because of the high profits that are there. These are all intertwined and the matter of education and curriculum and training uh, comes in. 
what are your thoughts about this uh, the relationship between curriculum uh, training education and industry needs any ideas from our panelists yeah. Yeah. go ahead go ahead sir yeah yeah you know um the lifetime of knowledge right now has become very short you no know? i mean um what 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 you learn what you learn in school becomes uh obsolete right away in fact um i i read an article recently that um i think uh uh now no 2020 or so 2020 or so um what you learn in engineering uh becomes obsolete in about two and a half years no half sorry half of what you learn in engineering becomes obsolete in in two and a half years no and then there there are now so many new um uh how do you say this uh disciplines coming out no very specialized disciplines that's re it's really impossible for for me no it's really impossible for for the academe to provide a i guess a program that will really cater to all possibilities in industry you know? mm -hmm. um so the for me the role of the role of the academy really is really just to train the students to learn how to learn you know? in other words to be able to adapt to be able to adapt to what's happening in the world you know? because all of these things right now they're just emerging left and right you know? mm -hmm. and and of course it's it's very important that you continue to know your basics very well you no know? your your fundamentals very well because you know when when all else fails that's what's going to carry you to the solution and application of the of the fundamentals. No? So for me, it's really very difficult for, for, for us to come up with a curriculum that will really cater to all of the needs of the Philippines right now, particularly in, in manufacturing. That, that's all. No? Thank you, Engineer Mantaring. Uh, some other thoughts, perhaps, on the matter? Uh, I see a smirk from uh, Attorney Cristobal earlier. <laughs> uh, any ideas, sir? <laughs> um or anyone if, if i may you know um yeah go ahead sir uh i've been in the shipyard industry for uh about 16 years uh not a very long time as far as uh, there's a lot of old timers in this business um but at the same time uh i had the privilege of uh our our shipyard is in hasaan which is right next to villanueva in in Cagayan de oro or in misamis oriental and if you remember when Hanjin Shipyard, uh, the one that was recently bought by Cerberus, but they were the they you know they came on the scene and they were the the single reason why we became number four in the world as far you know in 2015 as far as ship shipbuilding and ship exports are concerned. They had a 26,000 uh, person requirement for for their factory, you know, and they needed it so badly that they set up a training school in Villanueva um, where people were flocking to that town from uh, other provinces and other islands uh, to train the welders to, and then to send them to Subic uh, for that. One thing that struck me was um, they preferred completely untrained welders as opposed to welders who had some experience because they found that over time they found it's easier to train them from scratch than it is to train to unlearn habits and and, and mm -hmm. you know uh skills that were not appropriate for the kind of the kind of skill they were learning mm -hmm. um and then i and so that was one thing that that i noticed and, and i understand we're talking to a university now and not a technical vocational school yeah. but at the same time there it was clear that higher tech shipbuilding required a different skill set and if they if you learned on the on the old uh for those of you familiar it's stick welding um if you learn on the old stick welding method it will be harder for you to transition because you won't have the right experience or skill or it'll it'll take you it'll take quite some time to train you so they would just prefer to train someone brand new um i think that that is part of part of the, the uh, like Engineering Mantarik said, definitely um, train the university students to be learners, to be thinkers, to have an, enough basics to pick up the specialized training they're going to get on the job or in an industry. Um, but uh, to, to looking at the BPO industry, for instance, um, when it was started in the Philippines, I remember that uh, a story when 
uh, when the Ayalas were starting up the BPO industry and trying to sell to their client that yes, we can we can have great call centers and and, and call center agents here. They were actually hiring uh, graduates from UP Diliman, Ateneo, and Lasal to be their call center agents, right? Because they needed to convince them that oh, we are really good, capable English speakers, right? Um, and uh, and now my sister, who's in the industry. Uh, is explaining that they prefer their their number one school that they hire from is not any of those three. <laughs> it's PUP, mm -hmm. and they're even looking at senior high school only, as in no college experience. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, if you remember earlier, I mentioned the manufacturing companies invest in the Philippines because we had a pool. You know, we had skilled laborers. We had talent. We had we had people. Um, the BPOs came here as well for that same reason. We have English speakers. Right now, we're practically running out of English speakers, <laughs> and they can't go to the college students anymore. They have to go down to the to the high school students, yeah. right? But it's still, if, if, if for me, it's just as important as science and math. Uh, go ahead, you know, uh, teach them how to speak English, teach them how to how to do it well, and then they'll polish them in the schools. And if that's what you need, teach them accounting, and they can be part of the business process outsourcing field of services but i think that we all agree um, services doesn't need our help anymore at this stage uh, they seem to be uh employing a lot of people all very well on their own uh what we have to focus on is what does manufacturing need what what skills do they need do they need a uh, higher level uh training in mechanical skills and structural in in, in electrical uh, engineering yeah um and that's what will help us get ready to stand up manufacturing on its own legs. Okay, thank you, thank you, uh, sir. Uh, in the interest of time, let me please allow me to spill over towards the open forum, uh, which means that we will be entertaining a few questions from our participants, uh, and I will be reading some of them. Uh, Elton, hopefully... may I just uh, comment real quick. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yes, go ahead, uh, Doctor Lechita. Right. You know. Uh... Uh, Engineer Chicho is correct. You know, our our uh, institutions should uh, basically teach the students to learn. To learn. Um, but in addition, I think we have to also look at the basics. Uh, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, there are still many universities, when you talk about statistics, they teach you how to compute mean modes and averages. Well, the industry needs Six Sigma as a minimum, right? I was speaking in a, a, a event uh, one time and I just happened to ask, how do you do your lab experiments? Well, it's still one variable, one control. Mm -hmm. You'll have two variables and one control. Mm -hmm. We need design of experiments. We need to be able to understand the confluence of parameters, okay, and the effect of each, right? I was speaking in an ASEAN education minister's uh, uh, meeting one time. And when I was describing the gaps in our education system, the, the Hong Kong minister said, you know what your problem is in the Philippines? The schools, the academy doesn't recognize the industries as their customers. And, and that kind of, you know, uh, rang home. Even today, for example, and I'm not saying this is uh, for all the industries, some schools are just so enamored with board passers. Well, guess what? Our industry doesn't care about board passers. We, we want the skills. We want the, you know, the ability to yeah, learn and demonstrate the skills, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and the multinationals and even the electronics companies have their own training, uh, training program. So, I think um, learning, learning to learn is good, mm -hmm. but fundamentals, the basics, focusing on the right things, talking to the industry, mm -hmm. talking to the industry and understanding uh, what they need. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that would be helpful to be able to bridge that gap between what the industry needs and what that. You know, uh, 13 years ago, we went through the exercise of suggesting uh, improvements in the curriculum mm -hmm. uh, and we submitted it to Chad. Well, 12 year, years later, it was still in somebody's uh, miscellaneous box. Nothing, nothing was done. 
Mm-hmm. And so fortunately, uh, we were able to resurrect that discussion and to, and I don't mind calling Alina Ched, because of her persistence, we were able to start the dialogue and to, uh, uh, you know, identify the gaps. Because so we submitted eight improvements to engineering courses and four for applied sciences. Mm-hmm. But, you know, uh, the funny thing was when we, she arranged a, a, for a meeting with this panel from Jed and, this, and we were talking about IT. Let's talk about IT. I think uh, Dr. Lechica froze. He said, oh yeah, we already considered that three years ago. How can you? The technology just emerged <laughs> this year. So there's a gap between expectations and reality. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lechica. We have hands raised. And then afterwards, we'd also like to get some reactions from uh, our presenters earlier. Uh, Yusek Aldaba's hand is raised. And then afterwards, Attorney Cristobal. Go ahead, Yusek Aldaba. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. Uh, just very uh, quickly, I know I already spoke a lot too long uh, earlier. Um, but uh, I just would like, like to share that uh, DTI together with DOLE, TESDA, CHED, DEPED, uh, DOSC, including DICT and all um, the other government agencies, we're now really working together towards uh, the crafting of um, the Philippine skills framework. And this is really important in, if we are to address the jobs uh, skills mismatch, uh, w- which has been uh, um, a long standing, uh, a long, uh, this problem has been affecting us for so long uh, already. And uh, through this uh, skills framework, um, um, employers would be able to identify what the must have uh, skills and competencies are for, for potential employees and uh, they would be in a better position to design human uh, resource and talent development plans. And then for job seekers uh, through this uh, PSF, they would be able to define ways forward or um, how um, they could improve their uh, career path, knowing uh, the skills and the competencies uh, that are needed to uh, be acquired. And then for educational um, institutions, Um, they can use this uh, skills framework to revise existing Mm -hmm. curricula or design new courses um, based on, uh, of course, on uh, the future needs of uh, of industry. So um, really considering that uh, technologies uh, change really um, very fast, uh, the direction is really more towards uh, lifelong learning among our workers. Thank you, Yusek Aldama. Uh, Attorney Cristobal, go ahead, sir. Yes, Dan's comment just reminded me of a story. When I was the Director General of Intellectual Property Office, one of our major programs was to advocate that all universities in the country would have an intellectual property policy and then a technology transfer office. So now I think that's, that's been established and then there's been legislation on that now. But at that time, when I would go around and speak in UP and other universities, I met one of your esteemed professors, and I would say who, and, and he, he proudly told me he had two patents in the US Patent Office, one of the handful of Filipino scientists who had. And I asked him, so what did you do? And he just said, I'm, I just have the patent, you know, he published and all that. So trying to find innovation in linking with industry will also require a, a dramatic mind shift in the university and academia. The culture is really publish or perish when you should have room for patent and profit. So I think that was the main message, if I recall, that was our main message there. Don't rest just because you get the patent and, and it boosts your credentials and you get promoted. You move up a few more steps or a few more rounds. You've got to get it out there and uh, commercialize it. Thank you very much, Attorney Cristobal. Perhaps a reaction from uh, Dr. Dinoga, who uh, uh, I think ended his presentation earlier, particularly on that issue uh, of the role of the academia. 
actually all points quite well taken eh. um we do admit that there uh that uh some faculty do rest on their laurels with respect to the patents and publications um but um slowly we have gotten to be more aggressive um actually i'm quite pleased to have chisha mantaring here because uh he knows how we have been trying to 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 merge or actually to to bridge um the the industry with respect to the commercialization of of college products okay. um it's just maybe lamentable that with regards to how how fast we can do things there are certain limitations okay um i think chicho mentioned the things like uh, being able to update our our curricula every so often and back then five a five-year program with a new shed uh k-12 we have a four-year program for the college but he is correct okay that we have to to keep things up to date and one of the things that we do and uh, is actually we have to rely on well, industry experts like you guys to help us not just in providing the guidance but also to provide the the to be there to provide actually the lectures okay um i'm actually quite pleased for example with chicha when he actually went back to academia because he he shares what he knows uh firsthand okay and a lot of our students actually appreciate that there. So um, we are actually trying to gear up our curricula to involve more seminars and, and talks uh, to, in, to inject those new, new developments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Yanoga. Uh, reaction or response from uh, Dean Tapang? Yeah, um, that's the, the, the discussion is actually correct in the sense that you industry really is looking for um as as chicha said um, the pace of development has been very fast um but there's another aspect of academe that i need to put out the, here in the discussion um, because there are areas that are being researched that are not necessarily in the direction of the interest of um, industry at the moment for example, a case in point is the virus uh, that we had. Uh, it has been a research project by some of our faculty in the molecular biology. Then suddenly the COVID came here and we were a bit, it's not as fast as we would have wanted to, but there were quick shifts in the direction that they were able to, because they have the basic ideas and basic um, skill set of uh, how to transform these uh, into testing kits, into um, procedures and trainings for the, that were applicable during that time of uh, when COVID hit our country right now uh, at, uh, in 2020. So that's another aspect, I think, of the academe that uh, it probably industry would not be seeing right now. But there are areas that are being researched that probably has no impact immediately, but would have some um in a bit further um horizon would have some impact in the in, in the needs of uh, our country so that's uh, and therefore um although i agree that we have to address some of the needs of uh, industry we also have to sustain that uh, um capability to do other research uh, in, in uh, that it's not necessarily important at the moment, quote unquote, uh, for others. So, um, lastly, Siguro, um, um, I, I myself um, owe a lot with Earth Fee, even if I'm not from the College of Engineering, because Earth Fee has been helping me on my journey as an entrepreneur myself uh, from a research project that we've been doing. Uh, it's not easy, really, uh, until now, our startup is as at a loss because we're not really trained as scientists or engineers to think business uh, and um, in, in fact even within the university I think um, Dr. Diaz uh, of the ISSI and the BSB would be helpful but engineering as well has been helpful even for non-engineering 
faculty like me. And uh, those synergy is there, but uh, it's really, we really need to do more. Uh, that's what uh, something that we need to, we can agree on. Thank you, uh, Dean Tapang. We see uh, hands raised, uh, Dr. Rafisa, and then mm. afterwards, uh, Professor Diaz. Go yeah, ahead. So I just, I just want to add, no, um, I think we've had a lot of, you know, talkies. Uh, we had we've already like, sponsored a lot of like industry and uh, university discussions. But the thing that we really need to do is the mechanism and also the support from government. When you look at, for instance, and, and I think uh, Nito mentioned this, is that in, in other countries, it is the government that actually uh, leads the discussion with, uh, and, the, and, the, and the dialogue between, uh, between the university and, uh, and industry. Also in terms of like bringing in technology transfer, ensuring technology transfer that is coming from abroad. So in other words, we can discuss relentlessly what you know, industry wants, but at the end of the day, we do need to have like a, a, a uh, somebody that will, maybe, maybe that's the university, but again, as you're seeing here, the university does not, you know, it's not in the front line. The front line is actually industry. And, and, and in a way, when you're looking at industry and, 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 uh, and you know, the academy is coming in, your university, your science and technology, then you also have to see what is out there in terms of like what the competition is as far as you know what is the what is the what what's the standard what's the gold standard as far as technology is concerned that in itself is a it's a tall order and only government will be able to provide that kind of uh, resource to do that kind of research um, to help both the industry and the university produce something that's competitive so in a way, I'm, I'm just bringing in the, the, the role of government here, that there is a need, maybe BOSD, I think, and BPI have, have done a, a, a good job. But again, as we are seeing here, we still need to do a lot more if we want to compete uh, globally with, you know, with that. And I think the Filipinos, you know, we have the capacity. I think we have, we just need to have, you know, we have the, we have the capacity to learn, and we have the capacity to compete. The question is, do we get that support that we need to be able to, to you know, to, uh, to do what we have to do? Yeah, just that's it. Thank you, Dr. Rafiza. Uh, before I call on Professor Diaz, just uh, to also uh, put a bit of a space for those who posted questions, let me just read one question that's uh, reviewable also to our panelists. No? Uh, this is from Ana Marie Nemenzo. Uh, I start with the question posted by Dr. Tapang, uh, industrial policy for industrialization for whom? Uh, for decades, the government has prioritized expert-oriented development. This has only benefited foreign firms and those local companies tied with them created increased income inequality between owners of industry and the working people. Uh, why don't we prioritize development and production towards meeting domestic needs and consumption instead? Uh, especially as part of post-pandemic economic recovery. Why am I still hearing stress on high-value crops and products, presumably for export, trade and attraction of foreign investments, etc.? Why don't we answer the local needs and problems of our people first in the current period, which some NGOs and social movements call survival or recovery economy? No? Um, so that's a question posed by uh, Anna Marie Nemenzo. And then we have one, another one. Uh, from an anonymous attendee, if there is one sector within manufacturing that urgently needs help at the moment, given our country's limited money, what would that sector be and what can what help can be done? So those are two questions that uh, uh, at least as we move towards the closing of, uh, of uh, this webinar, uh, because we're conscious about time, we, maybe we can get some thoughts about it. But Professor Diaz, go ahead, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Hi. I would just like to uh, share uh, some of my thoughts regarding the synchronization of education with the need of the industry. I had uh, the privilege of being in the government, in the academe, and in the private sector, maybe of equal number of years. So I know exactly the sentiment of the private sector. I've been in the steel industry for 25 years. 
until I decided to return back to the academe. So what I've seen when I went back to the academe, particularly with ISSI, is a, a proven formula, okay, wherein the three components, research, okay, finds the need, tries to see the impact, okay, of intervention. The research will be there, addressing perhaps the concern of the, the discussants, okay. I see very relevance on that, no? and that will be addressed by the, the, the research. The, the second component, which I think is very important, is also the training and education. The training and education will rest on the, the role of the academe together with the private sector and the government. So they will have to fine tune their curricula. They will try to address the needs that were uh, un underscored during the, the, the research. And the third component is after the training in education, it might not be sufficient. There has to be a follow through. A follow through will have to be in the form of consultancy and mentoring. Okay, so uh, based on the, I just would like to also react to the, the comments of uh, Dean Tapang. No, uh, we yes, sir. We see the the potential of the academe in terms of turning out uh, cutting edge uh, products. The problem is how to commercialize some of those things, no? Because our our academe are not trained to be entrepreneurs. That's the reason why one of the advocacies of uh, ISSI, starting with the time that our chancellor was the, our director, was to perhaps uh, uh, help our educators and other identified sector of our society become entrepreneurs. We've been very good as uh, trained as a uh, student to become employees, but we were not trained by our education to be employers. So that's that's the the pity of uh, the status of our education. And if we can address these things, then I think we will be a better country. Okay, for the next next sets of generations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Diaz. Uh, just a time check for everyone. It's about uh, eleven. Uh, it's about twelve fourteen on my clock. Uh, perhaps we can now just get very briefly uh, closing statements from our panelists who uh, would like to uh, share their final thoughts about industrial policy and about uh, this webinar in general. Uh, uh, briefly, please, a anyone who would like to give their closing. That'd be fine. So yes. maybe I yes go ahead, uh, Dr. Rapisan. So um, so first of all, I'd like to, to thank everyone um, with the uh, you know uh, having industry and the academy and, and the university of course um, together is always like it's always a learning experience experience and we also can tend to see what the gaps are and also like what we actually still need to do to make that connection. Um, Again, every our experience at the CIDS uh, has been that uh, you know, like industry, especially uh, like the shipbuilders, we've had you know two or three roundtable discussions, and it's so hard to move that discussion from from the from the uh, meeting room to like you know where the plants are, where the you know. So, and I think that's where we will hope that we will be able to make that connection. I agree with that. Last with that. Dr. Denoga, that part of that would really be, you know, bringing, you know, going to the plant site and 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 seeing what really will it, what it will take for, you know, the academe to actually know what, you know, what the situation is. I've had experience or I've had um, uh, conversations with, for instance, uh, Ronald Gaspar, a, a engineer, Ronald Gaspar, who's in, who invited us to. Uh, to their plant, and and so in a way, when we're talking about you know localization of uh, and 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 parts and components, because I think that's where we can in fact make a you know make a real contribution 
is in the parts and components at this point in time is to actually know what exactly industry need. And, and that kind of conversation, I think, is, is where we should be heading toward next. Yung ganong nuts and bolts na tayo. So hopefully, uh, we'll be continuing this conversation. Maraming salamat. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rakisa. Before we formally close uh, our webinar, uh, just a few announcements. We'd like to remind our participants uh, that those who will answer the evaluation form sent through Zoom chat uh, will receive certification or certificates of participation after the webinar. Uh, so please do answer the evaluation. Uh, and at this point, to formally close this webinar, uh, here are uh, here's, here's the closing remarks from uh, Secretary Fortunato de la Peña. Good morning once again to everyone, to uh, President uh, Concepcion of uh, the UP system, to Chancellor Nemenso, the other university officials, colleagues in government, representatives from industry, from media, guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to take advantage of the opportunity given to me to give this closing uh, message by uh, sharing with you what uh, we have discussed uh, very recently in our Governing Council of the Philippine uh, Council for Industry, Energy, and Emerging Technologies, R&D. And I am referring to what I will call DOST clustering of industry roadmaps. Now, uh, we actually uh, made preliminary uh, assessments, made decisions, and uh, set directions in uh, identifying these uh, industry roadmaps and in, in clustering them. It involved an assessment of our priority trust. Uh, we took a look at the major R&D priority trust uh, as, uh, as aligned to the 21 delineated areas of concern. This is covering the period 2017 to 2022. And uh, we came up with the following uh, uh, groupings of uh, technologies actually which are of priority. Uh, first is the group on appropriate technologies for industry competitiveness. Uh, this uh, de definitely would include uh, uh, nutritious, safe, and affordable food for all at all times, more micro, small, and medium enterprises developing and producing competitive and world-class products and services, more industries enabled by state-of-the-art R&D technologies and science-based policies moving up the value chain and attracting foreign direct investments. We have a grouping under sustainable energy. And uh, the objective here is to continue the development and deployment of cost-efficient smart technologies. Also to increase the adaptation of renewable energy systems and uh, uh, to apply technologies addressing solutions for renewable and alternative energy. We also have a group here called Sustainable Mass Transport, and uh, this uh, involves integrated, responsive, effective, efficient, and safe land transport systems. It also involves cleaner and efficient maritime transport systems and services. And uh, of course, uh, uh, we uh, hope to contribute to addressing the issues on road congestion, like poor mobility, stress, and health-related impacts and the high fuel consumption and opportunity loss in productivity. We have a fourth grouping here called environment, climate change, adaptation, and disaster risk reduction. And here we want to provide science and technology-based support in addressing critical activities on climate change adaptation and disaster risk mitigation, as well as the protection of our country and its citizens against national threats. There are, of course, uh, uh, special concerns we put together under uh, special concerns. Now, uh, what were the directions uh, and decisions that were undertaken uh, uh, involved in the assessment of priority trust? Well, uh, we first uh, had um, a technology assessment. Uh, the major programs uh, were uh, assessed with respect to the utilization of the project results. And uh, of course, uh, uh, some pitching activities, and uh, of course, the technology diffusion, uh, transfer, and utilization uh, situation. 
we also look at the impact assessment on uh, uh, the benefits of the interventions, the impact on growth and development. We took a look at how uh, this project enhanced the capability in policy development and advocacy, and also in terms of increasing the number of policy instruments developed and deployed. We also took a look at the linkages that were built and uh, uh, the collaborations in SNST that were fostered. Uh, we took a look at how they harness research capabilities of consortia, of R&D institutions, of the academe, the private sector, and the LGUs. We took a look at the increase in the number of engagements to the Council's programs and services offerings, also in terms of the increase in number of international scientific and technological cooperation in these areas, and of course in generating resources and expertise. We also look at how social marketing and branding uh, has addressed customer requirements resulting to positive attributions to, to us, particularly in this case, be shared. Now, what were the roadmaps? Uh, here is uh, a clustering uh, following the groups that I have earlier identified. Under appropriate technologies for industry competitiveness, we have the food sector, the process sector that includes textile, agro-industrial processing, and natural products. We have the creative industries, including footwear and furniture. We have metals and engineering. We have mining and minerals. We have advanced materials. We have nanotechnology. We have optics and photonics. We have ICT innovations and electronics. Under the environment, climate change, adaptation, and disaster risk reduction cluster, the industry roadmaps would uh, include the environment sector, the clean air, water, uh, environment, the disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation uh, sector, and uh, under sustainable energy, of course, the energy sector, uh, which has uh, uh, a number of uh, items under it. In the sustainable mass transport, uh, we have the transportation sector, uh, we, in, which includes marine transport, intelligent transport systems, land transport, logistics, and freight. And under special concerns, uh, we have some items in our priority agenda, human security, data science, artificial intelligence, creative industries, and of course, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic initiatives. The other programs are actually more of uh, approaches uh, in support of R&D and uh, technology commercialization and technology startups. So we have our technology business incubation program, our startup program, the University Technology Transfer Program, we have the IDP program, consortia program, Balik Scientist program, IDP means institutional development, uh, we have the human resource development program, you have, we have the youth innovation program, we have or young innovators program, we have the goddess program, which is really application of uh, 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 artificial intelligence in uh, uh, many government frontline services, and we have the science communication program. Uh, of course, uh, we have space technology apps, uh, also technologies in construction, and in un unmanned vehicle uh, systems, as well as in uh, utilities. In all of this, we uh, hope to get uh, convergence uh, among the different uh, sectors, uh, not only DOST and the uh, national agencies concerned, but also the private uh, sector in particular and the local government units uh, uh, included. So uh, this now, the roadmaps that uh, we have identified here is, is still, of course, uh, uh, going to be subjected to discussion. Uh, but these are uh, the start, this is the starting point of uh, our clustering of roadmaps. And uh, uh, the roadmaps, of course, uh, will be developed uh, participatively, okay? And, uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, this will have to be governed by certain policies and guidelines in implementation. So uh, this is my contribution to our uh, 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 forum that we have conducted, to the series that has been conducted. And I would like to thank uh, uh, UP for inviting me to this uh, event. Thank you very much. Once again, thank you very much, uh, everyone, uh, for attending. Uh, of course, uh, before we really close this uh, webinar, 
we would like to request all the participants, all our panelists to turn on their cameras so we can have a, a quick photo op. Uh, we're calling on Andrian to do the honors of taking the photo for this uh, uh, webinar, please. Let's open our uh, cameras uh, if we can, please. Thank you. Go ahead, Andrian. Okay. okay na Andrian. Uh, okay. Oh. One, two, three. Si Dr. Lachika po hindi naka-open yung camera. Pero si isa pa daw. One, two, three. Okay na, Andrian. Okay. okay. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, before uh, we leave, uh, we'd just like to confirm that we received a lot of questions for our panelists. Uh, uh, and really, due to the lack of time, we kulang talaga ang oras natin. But rest assured, uh, please stay tuned. We will be sending those questions to the panelists and uh, CIDS and the political economy program will uh, stage again, you know, or stage several events so that those questions, very, very uh, helpful and significant questions could be uh, answered. No? Uh, so thank you very much once again. Uh, at least at this point, uh, we'd like to thank the following again, uh, the UPD Task Force Nation Building under the Office of the Chancellor, uh, conveners, uh, UP College of Engineering led by Dr. Gerald Denoga, uh, UP Center for Integrative and Development Studies Political Economy Program led by Dr. Antoinette Rakiza. Our speakers, Dean Giovanni Tapang, Dr. Gerald Denoga, Mr. Rolando Ramon, uh, Professor Ran Rolando Ramon Diaz, and Dr. Antoinette uh, Rakiza. Our discussants, of course, uh, Yusek Rafaelita Aldaba, Attorney Adrian Cristobal Jr., Mr. Manileo Carlos III, Dr. Dan Lachica and uh, Engineer Rafael Nestor Mantaring, uh, of course, Secretary Fortunato de la Peña, our co-presenters for this event, DZUP, and the uh, Diliman Information Office. We definitely would like to thank everyone for attending this webinar. Uh, thank you very much to all of you. Uh, and uh, perhaps uh, last uh, words, uh, Dr. Rakisa, uh, before we close just, this. Yeah. So I'll just... Not the but I just want to thank you, Jalton, for uh, for moderating uh, this uh, this event. Maraming salamat sa lahat. You're thank welcome you. po. My pleasure. Sige po. So maraming maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Mag-iingat po kayo. Uh, at kita-kita uh, po tayo sa susunod na event ng CIDS uh, at ng uh, PEP. Salamat po. Thank, thank you. you everyone.